time getting washes. I'm running a little late then. Let's open, if we could, in a word of prayer. Father, we do pray again as we look at your word uh, that you would uh, bless our soul with all the grains of truth garnered from it today, that it would take deep root, be refreshed by your spirit, your light and ultimately harvested to our joy and your praise. And I pray that today we gain profit from what we read in your word as a treasure beyond any money we can have, uh, sweeter than any food we can have, and uh, just enable us to distill from the pages of Scripture today uh, truth, how to pray, understanding better who you are, and uh, show us also, Lord, uh, how our words have too often been unfaithful to you, so that your word, we align ourselves with your faithful word. Help us not to say those things injurious to others, empty of grace, full of folly, that are dishonoring to our calling. And So, Lord, we pray at the end of the day, you'd write your words upon our heart, inscribe them on our lips, and may our reading of your word, our understanding of it, be to your glory, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. <coughs> okay, I sent an email out today. Uh, you might check your emails the first thing in the morning when you um, begin your day. And uh, what I was trying to get you to do is work on the translation assignment for tomorrow. How many got that email? Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, because I, I would like you in the morning, um, actually... Uh, yeah, in the morning to get into the library as soon as you can and to start working on the Jewish part of this uh, paper, the Jewish background part, because we're going to do a library tour tonight that will prepare you. Be sure that tonight you bring that bibliography that I mentioned to you. Have you been able to get on the course online site? Great. Super. Okay. It took me a while to kind of get used to it. So. Um, um, Okay, uh, so uh, I would encourage you tonight, I mean, it's intense, okay, tonight um, try to do that assignment on the interpretative use and the theological use on Isaiah 22, 22, and Revelation 3, 7. Just write that paragraph tonight because by the time we finish the library, they'll be closed. You can't work on the thing, but uh, I think the library opens. Does the library open at 8 o'clock? I think it's up till 8 o'clock, yeah. 8 o'clock. I would really try to get there in there at 8 and, and work for three hours on this. It's a part of your paper. Um, so we'll see how much work that you get done. But if you can do that, it's really crucial. Of course, the rest of you, you don't need to do that. But, you know, if you, if you want to, uh, you, you can. But the only time you'll have these sources is here. You, it'd be too hard to get them elsewhere. And, and likely a lot of the theological libraries you could be near may not have these sources. Now, you're in Delaware, is that right? Mm-hmm. How far away are you from Princeton? You could probably... I'm closer to here than I am Princeton. Okay. Well, probably best to... How, how far of a drive? And come up here, okay, to do the research. So you're in really pretty good shape, but you guys are too far away. So, um, But I would still encourage you so you don't have the burden later to do as much as you can here on that. Assignment. Okay, so work on that translation uh, um, as soon as you can if you haven't, and then do the um, interpretative use and theological use. You can see that what I'm getting you to do is part seven and eight of the ninefold approach to interpreting a text. And so it's seven and eight that I'm having you work on, all right? Step seven and eight. So, um, Let's proceed on. We were, we're continuing on with the uh, ways that the um, New Testament uses the Old Testament. And all of this, these are the, 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 the what, 12 ways. Let's get this back on here. Um, let's see. I'll get my computer out.
These are all the 12 ways that um, New Testament is used in the Old. Let's pull those up real quick just to have them on. And, Well, the mine won't open that particular document, so we'll open this. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, use this particular thing on here. You know, maybe we need to get Sam in because this isn't popping up for me uh, wirelessly. Or can yeah, you do that? You need to. Every time you come in here, you have to. Uh, go here. Try Chrome. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're the man. Okay. So here, here we. Uh, I just have the list presented a little differently here. Um, It doesn't? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to make that bigger? Yeah. How do you do that? What'd you do? You'll use two fingers. Yeah. And then slowly the spectrum out. It zooms in when it zooms out. Two fingers. Okay. So, yeah. This is. Okay. Okay, thanks. You can just use two hands like this and just do this. Okay. So it's easier. Okay. Two fingers only. Only two fingers. Do you have to choose it? No, no. You don't have to choose it. You kind of slowly touch it. Okay. Slowly touch right. it. <laughs> it's a little bit hard in the beginning, but Does once you get used to it. Does control button work too? Con uh, I don't know because app was a little bit different. Like so the plus or a I don't think a control plus does it. Mm. And it depends on the software you use, too. If it's Word, yeah. maybe. Okay. Else, so. so here are the categories that we're talking about here. Um, we talked about direct or indirect fulfillment of prophecy right here, affirming the fulfillment of a not yet Old Testament prophecy. Uh, and we talked about the analogical illustrative use of the Old Testament, symbolic use of the Old Testament, which we said could be a subcategory of um, the uh, analogical or illustrative use. Uh, we talked about the abiding uh, authority of the Old Testament being indicated, for example, by uh, that phrase, just as it is written. Proverbial use of the Old Testament, which I, one of you, I can't remember, mentioned, maybe that would be a subcategory like the symbolic use of the analogical, and I think it's a good comment, just may well be. Uh, so you can see these overlap in that regard. And then the... Um, now we're at the uh, rhetorical use. We're going to look at the prototypical use of the Old Testament. We're going to look at the textual use, assimilated use, and ironic use. So we still have some uses to go. But all of this is fleshing out step number seven of uh, the nine-step method. Step number seven is hermeneutical use of the Old Testament. And so when you come to that step, there are a few other things you need to do. You'll summarize everything you've done before, as you'll see, uh, as an introduction to step seven. And, uh, in fact, I can 
do that now. So you can see this is uh, step seven. So you review everything you've done in steps two through six, okay, as you'll see. And, um, and then uh, you want to ask, and I hadn't mentioned this yet, but you want to ask, is this Old Testament allusion or quotation uh, referenced elsewhere in the New Testament? Now, how will you know that? Anybody? Let's say you're dealing with Isaiah 54.1 in Galatians chapter 4. And, 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 and what about that book? And the margin gives all the okay. other uses. That's right. But to find the other uses, you'd have to look at every margin of every page. So how do you find it? Still that book. In the back, you just look. It's, they all begin with Genesis all the way to the end of the canon. It'll tell you everywhere else it occurs in the New Testament. And so what you want to do is part of, I mean, that tool is amazing, okay? That tool is going to make you a redemptive historical Bible study uh, teacher and, and a preacher. And, uh, I mean, it, it really caused your teaching and preaching to have meat so that you ask, okay, how is it? If it's used twice elsewhere, how is it used? What's the context there? Is it different? If so, uh, how is it different? All right. Um, and then... Uh, So how is it different? Then D, is your text cited by any later Christian writers? I'm going to show you that this evening, how to find that. Okay, we'll do that together with the Jewish uh, uh, material, and that'll help you. And anything cited by the apostolic fathers. And I'd want you to only go to about 200 A.D., and I'll tell you what sources to use for that tonight. Okay? So then you would ask again, well, how is this uh, father using it? All right? This is important. Ideally, it'd be good to go on all the way up to Augustine, you know, up to about 400 A.D., but for your purposes, we'll say 200 A.D. Um, and because um, that's important, how was this text received, i.e. interpreted, by the later church? Does this give us some insight? Because they're commentators too, okay? Very important. Richard, what's the name of that document? I remember you showed it to us. But the name of what? The name of that document is a template for the writing of the paper, I think. You see that? Template for the writing. It's on the first page menu. First page. Yeah. Template for the writing of the paper. And then I say, using Beale's categories from Chapter 4 of his handbook, and what we've been going over, but it's all right there in Chapter 4, uh, uh, and here, here they are. So when you come, at this point, you say, all right, how is this text being used? Is this a direct fulfillment of direct verbal prophecy? Is this typological indirect fulfillment? Is this analogy? Is this a symbolic use? Is this, is this a, a, a stock in trade? So on and so on. We'll, co we'll, we'll cover some of the other uses, okay? So everything in here is designed to help you interpret the old and the new uh, um, for your ministries in whatever way, whether it's writing, whether it's uh, teaching, or it's preaching. Uh, of course, I, I think the best preacher is a teacher preacher, so, um, uh, so that people feel like they've, they've heard a sermon, but they've been taught. That's the ideal, isn't it, uh, in my opinion? So, um, and then, you know, uh, what you, what you want to do, there may be some overlapping uses. You want to uh, be aware of that. Um, and then step eight, of course, is... Analyze the author's theological use, and finally nine is rhetorical use, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Okay. Now, so let's continue on with the the uses, and we are now at uh, step number. Um, let's see. I think we're at uh, this is step eight. Okay, I don't have my, my basic handout. I, and I left my, my hard copy. So whatever the next step is, is it eight? <laughs> I'll let you I'll let you tell me the numbers because I've I've. Um, my notes here have the numbers a little bit out of order. So the rhetorical use, you got that at step eight? Good. Yep. Or we might call it the embellishment use of the Old Testament. 
This is where Old Testament language is expressed with a view only to being persuasive or impressive in effect. doesn't primarily convey information. So let me give you an example. Some argue, as I recollect, like Richard Longenecker, um, who, by the way, is an evangelical uh, New Testament scholar, in Romans chapter 10, this would be an example. And, and we'll look at Romans 10 in just a moment in his quotation of Deuteronomy 30 in verses 6 through 8. And, um, but basically, I call this the Israeli politician use. Let's say you're an Israeli politician. You want to get elected. Well, in Israel, you've got the real fundamentalist Jews. You know, wear the hats and the curled hair that comes down here and the aprons and the whole thing. And then you got moderates. And then you have people that they just are kind of patriotic. They, want to, they move to Israel because that's their homeland and they're not really that religious. And uh, so if you're speaking to the really religious group as an Israeli politician and you're trying to, you know, uh, get their favor, you give a speech, a talk that really is just sprinkled with Old Testament quotations and especially allusions, so that you're giving an Old Testamentish kind of tone to your uh, your talk, uh, so that they'll you know think that you are really uh, aligned with them. Your 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 sympathies are with them. Hey, you don't care anything about what it means. You're, you're just making it sound, you know biblically flowery, okay? You know, putting a lot of petals on it. And, um, but you're not really referring to the context of any of the... You're not concerned to interpret or any... Israeli politician may not even know how to interpret. So, um, uh, so that, that, that's the use. And so Paul, many would say Paul is using Deuteronomy 30 that way. If you're with me, you're with me in chapter 10, verse... Uh, We'll begin at 5, for Moses writes, The man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus, Do not say in your heart. Now he's beginning to quote Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 12. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of truth which we are preaching. And... Uh, so you can see he, he's applying this to Christ in each case. At the end of verse uh, 8, 6, he quotes part of it. Don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That's to bring Christ down. Or who will ascend into the best. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But, but Deuteronomy doesn't say that. Deuteronomy is talking about the law and, and how it's available now. You don't have to go to heaven or go to the depth of the sea or the end of the earth to get it. It's right there. I'm giving it to you. Here it is at Sinai. And uh, which chapter 7 in Acts says here are living words of God. So if it's right here with you. And now he's t saying this is Christ. And so many, like Long and Ecker, would say, clearly this is just a typical uh, uh, example of an apostle, in this case Paul, having a Christocentric lens, reading it into a place where it never was an inkling of thought in the mind of Moses. Okay? And so he's just using it just as, well, this is flowery, you know, this is uh, 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 in some way it may, it's related to the Old Testament. It may be uh, because the readers see the Old Testament as authoritative, he, he just quotes it for that reason, in the same way an Israeli politician might. Um, so he's not concerned with the context and the meaning of the Old Testament, just wants to uh, affirm the idea that uh, this, this has an Old Testament sound to it and it's somehow related to Christ, but he's, he's, he's misinterpreting. That's the typical rhetorical use. Now, I want to say something here. I, I really need to change the names, but I haven't yet. This rhetorical use, in my opinion, I don't see it happening anywhere in the New Testament. But if it did, um, I, I suppose it wouldn't violate the idea of context if the author's just using it to sound... Old Testament-ish, if you will. <laughs> I just don't see that happening because every time I go to the Old Testament again and again and again, uh, there's a contextual co connection and, and something carried over from the context. But it's theoretically possible that you could hold this kind of view and not believe it contradicts. Just your purpose is not to be contextual. Your purpose is to say, well, I'm just 
you know, using this for flowery purposes. Well, that's possible. I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, but the, the full orb rhetorical use is it's not just flowery, but it's a misuse, okay? Not just for flowery purposes and embellishment. It's a, it is a misuse. By the way, this is the text where I became a believer in the verse, next verse, chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I remember reading that, and uh, uh, I thought, God, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard that. Of course, I had. I'd, I'd been witnessed to when I was in sixth grade by someone from Campus Crusade. But, um, uh, but I said, gosh, yeah, okay, I believe that. I'd never really affirmed it one way or another, and so I said, I believe it. And, and from that point on, it changed my life. I had a desire to read Scripture. I had a desire to evangelize. I remember I, was, I started witnessing to people. Nobody told me to witness. And, uh, and I had a desire to pray. I'd always viewed prayer as very liturgical and mechanical. And so, uh, so at any rate, that, that text is close to my heart, as the text says. The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. Um, so that's a rhetorical use. Don't confuse it with step nine, which is also a rhetorical use. That's why I need to change the names, okay? Why don't we call this the embellishment use? Let's change it now. This is the embellishment use of the old and the new. And rhetorical use, we'll say, from a final step, which I think is a legitimate step, how is Paul or whoever using this text to motivate his readers to believe something he's talking about or to take a particular course of action, just like you in your sermons. Your point is to try to persuade people on the basis of the meaning of the Bible and our accountability, et cetera. So, um, yeah. I'm just wondering if, you know, Jesus, you know, being the Word of God made flesh, like if, if that's any kind of connection point with, um, you know, here he's talking about, you know, the law and his commandment are far from you. Um, so I, I have no idea, but I, that's, that's what came to my mind. It's like, but Jesus is the Word. You know, mm-hmm. like, like that, that's not, those aren't, you know, very different. For yeah, I, I'd have to think if there's a direct connection between Jesus being called the Word in this text. But generally speaking, very broadly speaking, I think you're on to something because I didn't really say what would be the response to this embellishment use in this text. And it would be that Jesus, whereas in the Old Testament the epitome of God's revelation, the zenith point was the law, right? That was it, given at Sinai. Now, the zenith point of God's revelation is Jesus Christ. He is the, he, he is the greater revelation of the law. And so this text, the reason Paul does what he does by applying Deuteronomy to Jesus is because Jesus is now the goal. The law has come to completion in him because it pointed to him. And he says that. Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the telos, the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. There it is right there. And so that word telos can be translated either as goal or end. And probably both are in mind. In other words, the end of the law is the zenith of God's revelation has come in Christ because he's the greater revelation. And yet that is the goal of the law. All along it pointed to Christ who would reveal in a greater way than the law. Now some would say, well, that's also twisting the text as well. Well, um, as as we'll see, I don't don't think so. Um, In fact, uh, Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so... um, If, in fact, Christ is the last Adam, uh, and Adam was the ultimate wise man before the fall, which which I think we can, I can demonstrate, he's able all of a sudden to name animals, do do things almost from nothing. I mean, God gave him speech, he's able to name all these animals and uh, so forth and so on. This is why Solomon uh, is a last, is a second Adam figure. Uh, He he was excellent at, at, at naming different plants. And, uh, well, he, 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 was, he was an expert in botany and zoology. And, and there are certain allusions to Solomon that uh, go back to Genesis 1 to 3. I talk about this in the beginning of my 
New Testament uh, biblical theology. Wait a minute. What happened to it? that makes sense what yeah, I'm sure. You know, if there's trying to say that that's not what he's building on, it's not yeah. pointing to the future, then what is their argument? What are they arguing for? Right. Sometimes they're just trying to argue against right. how fuddy-duddy evangelicals have taken this text okay. and that they're not really realizing. They only have one lens. It's very narrow. And well, sometimes. At other times, they, they, they may... Uh, say, how marvelous is the Holy Spirit. It can even contradict God's earlier statements. All right. I remember sitting in the cafeteria at Gordon Connell. A student came up to me and he said, oh, I was reading this Old Testament text a few months ago and oh, it really hit me what it was saying. It was amazing. He says, and just the other day I read the same text. It hit me again. It was just amazing. And it was absolutely contradictory to my earlier understanding. Isn't God marvelous? Now, he had a, was had a good heart and this sort of thing. I mean, he was preaching right doctrine from wrong texts at that point. But um, uh, so, you know, some would say, you know, God, God's not bound to, you know, how marvelously sovereign he is. I mean, that, that, that could be one kind of argument. I mean, it could be a number of... But how would that speak, uh, I'm sorry, how would that speak to, to him being truth and, you know, the truth remaining truth? Well, he would just say God is, is uh, uh, you can't bind God's sovereign mind. He may say one thing at one time and develop that in a contradictory way, and uh, God's mysterious, something like that. I think it's... <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, uh, just a, yeah. That's a, that, that's some so that's some desire, reason too. There's a desire to protect scripture in a sense of not allowing yeah. it to be to add to right and to re, there's a desire for there not to be eisegesis for some I don't know for all of them but right. that would be a reason why they would argue against this type of thing. Well, if you can read that in, then you can read anything in. Here yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah, some would say that this is an application of the Old Testament, so we we shouldn't try to make an application consistent with the meaning in the Old Testament. Well, my answer to that would be, yeah, it should be consistent. It's, a, it's an outgrowth. An application is an outgrowth. So, is, is, that Fran, is that a Francis thing where he said typology was not exegesis but it was an application? No, I don't think he was saying that. Okay. We'll talk about that because there are different understandings of typology and uh, uh, some it's theological interpretation of Scripture or for some... Uh, its uh, its application and, and and so on. We'll we'll actually we'll actually go through that. But yeah, I think for him it may be either application or uh, theological app, uh, application, something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's move on, and um, let's go to the uh, what I'll call. Uh, the midrashic or framework use of the Old Testament. Midrashic or framework use of the Old Testament. This is number nine. Midrashic or framework use. Now, uh, put a slash there and say blueprint or prototypical use. Blueprint or prototype use. And what we have in mind here is that an author has one Old Testament context in mind, a, 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 a chapter, say. And it forms the structure for the New Testament chapter. So it's a, it's a prototype. It's a blueprint, okay? It's like a template. So a New Testament writer will go back to a, a whole segment, maybe a chapter, half chapter, and bring that over and have it in mind and let that become the framework for his chapter or his half chapter, whatever it is. Um, and what he'll do, that one Old Testament chapter, let's say it's Daniel 7. Um, by the way, in this class, uh, if I ask a question and you're unsure of the answer, the following will get you close. Uh, if you say, 
you have no idea, you say Daniel 7, that might get you close. <laughs> New creation, that may get you close. Eden, that may get you close. Already and not yet, temple will really get you close. Already and not yet eschatology, that'll get you close. So all of those, if you're unsure, you can take a stab at it, and you might be 70% uh, uh, at getting close to the answer, all right? So, because those are my lenses, you know, and um, all right. So what will happen, the author will bring, let's say, Daniel 7 over, and that forms a structure maybe of his chapter. And then what he'll do is, bring, is allude or quote other Old Testament references from outside Daniel to interpretatively expand that framework of Daniel 7 he has in mind. What's he doing? He's interpreting Scripture by Scripture. And he's filling out the meaning of Daniel 7 from other texts. Just as, it's biblical theology. It's beautiful. I'm going to show you some examples. Um, sometimes uh, how he brings in other texts, let's say, out of Daniel 7, uh, the association uh, is, is made either by a common theme or a common picture or a common phrase that's found in other texts outside Daniel. That's, that's how he brings, th th those are the hermeneutical magnets, if you will. Uh, uh, whatever is a common theme, picture, or phrase then it can, can be brought in to expand. And this helps a lot because I, I, I find some of these uh, in the book of Revelation. And the reason it helps in the book of Revelation, as we'll see in one moment, is because uh, there's an Old Testament allusion almost in every verse of Revelation, sometimes two or three. So, you know, what's going on there? I mean, just myriads. How do you organize that? How do you understand that? Do you just go back to each Old Testament allusion and try to understand it and then come back? And if there are three in one verse, you do that and... What's going on? I think the way to organize those in many cases is to perceive a framework if, 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 it's, if it's there, say like Daniel 7. And then uh, the other illusions can be organized in terms of seeing how they amplify and interpret Daniel 7. So let, let's look at some examples here. Um, and I have, I have some handouts for you. Now, you'll notice that the first thing I've given you uh, is the mist are the mystery handouts from yesterday. That's just for you. Um, actually, the rest of this is online, but I find it sometimes more convenient to give you a paper copy, and then you'll have it online as well. So what we're looking at now, and while this is a little small, you can look at yours. Um, let me... Go back over. Okay. Okay. Now this is is very interesting. What I did when I when I wrote my dissertation, uh, it was. Is that not that should this should be on. It's a little different. Okay, yeah, this just looks a little different. It's on the third page, okay? Keep going. There. Um, this is from a, a Qumran document called the War Scroll. It's abbreviated as 1QM uh, because M stands for uh, uh, Milkama, which is war and in Hebrew. It's 1QM, and it's very interesting. When I wrote my dissertation... Uh, it was on the use of, uh, actually, Daniel in the book of Revelation. And I just wanted to jump in and start doing that. And my supervisor said, no. No, you're going to spend a year reading Jewish apocalyptic literature. And I said, what? <laughs> I, mean, I was, I was hyper-canonical, you see. Yeah. Because I already mentioned that Jewish commentaries, which is anything that's interpreting the Old Testament, uh, are our oldest commentaries. And uh, one of the um, 
I, I suppose you would say patron saints of Westminster is named Cornelius Van Til. And he's, he's, he, was, uh, he, he was a professor of, of apologetics. He was very well known for paraphrasing 2 Corinthians 10, I believe around verse 4 or 5, which says, bring, uh, 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 bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. So, you know, well, of course, Scripture, we do that. Uh, but, you know, we're to do that with our life. If we're married, our marriage relationship, we have children with them. The whole, whole of life is to be brought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Every thought. Well, how about ancient thoughts outside the Bible? We certainly shouldn't exclude those. And so, you know, um, so at any rate, I didn't have that mentality. You know, when I, at first, I was like, oh, God, I don't want to deal with Judaism. It's not inspired and so forth and so on. So I was one of those that, that had that view. Um, and so... Uh, one of the things I began to read as I began to go through, I began to see, gosh, these Jewish authors sort of model whole chapters on uh, whole segments of the Old Testament. So I began thinking, hmm, could John be doing that in the book of Revelation? And, um, uh, and indeed, I, I decided, yeah, I think that's what he's doing, not because he's imitating a Jewish exegetical method, but because it makes sense that both New Testament methods of interpretation and Jewish methods of interpretation would resemble one another if they're going back to the same source. Ultimately, I think they're modeling themselves after uh, later Old Testament writers interpreting earlier Old Testament texts, just as I said yesterday, the presuppositions of the New Testament writers, and we'll look at those again, see how that is so. They're from the Old Testament as well. So... For example, I think Psalm 8 is all based on Genesis 1, 26 to 28, where it talks about Adam, and it's the most explicit Adam psalm anyway. So you have these, these texts, that, 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 that you have these framework models. So here, what I've done is, this column is clear illusion, this is probable illusion, this is possible illusion. Uh, I, I could have said highly probable and probable, doesn't matter, but you'll notice that this is a description of the beginning of a war. They believe they're going to undergo a war against Rome and the Jewish apostates and the allies of Rome. And that, uh, the priests would go out in front of them, just as at Jericho and at other times, and uh, the angels would enable them to beat the Romans in this final eschatological battle. So it's very eschatological. And so in explaining this battle, they concluded they believed they were going to fulfill the prophecies in Daniel, especially in this case, Daniel 11 and 12. And so in explaining it, they do biblical theology. They apply it to themselves. I, I think they were wrong in applying it to themselves, but, you know, they made a good attempt at it. Uh, their biblical theology is very, really good. Uh, so it says that after this war, they'll go up fence against the troops, the Katim in Egypt. The Katim are the Romans. And in his appointed time, uh, he shall go forth with great wrath to fight against the kings of the north. This is God who will go forth. And, um, uh, and so the, the, everything underlined is especially found right here, secondarily here and here. So I'm not going to go through all of that. You can, I, I have a book called um, The Use of Daniel in Jewish Apocalyptic and in uh, the Revelation of St. John. You can get that from Whip and Stock now. Uh, originally published by University Press of America. So, uh, and you can see how I explain it. But, um, and then here, the time of, to destroy utterly and to cut off the horn of Belial. Um, probably comes from both Daniel 11, Daniel 7 and 8. Uh, the time of salvation. This will be the time of salvation, Isaiah 49, 8. And uh, um, here, there'll be immense confusion for the sons of Japheth and Asher shall fall. Uh, Zechariah 13, uh, Isaiah 31, um, and uh, down here, with uh, the wicked will be crushed without a remnant, and, and an escape there will not be. That's a quotation right out of Ezra 9, 14. So you can see here, it's Daniel 11, and if we were to keep going on, it will be Daniel 12. So he has a framework of Daniel 11 and 12, but you can see 
he brings in other texts. Isaiah 49, 8, Zechariah, Isaiah 31, Ezra 9. And they're brought in to amplify, to interpret the picture. He's, this is biblical theology by a Jewish exegete. That's pretty good. Okay? So this is one thing I began to notice. And, and I could put up others for you. You can find the other examples in, in my book that I just mentioned. Um, but let's go to another example. Let's go to a biblical example now. And here's one in Revelation. Okay, that should be in the next page. Is that correct? And as I begin studying Revelation 4 through 5, it's really one vision. In, in chapter uh, 4, it's God on the throne, and it concludes with glory and worship. Chapter, that's chapter 4. Chapter 5, Lamb receives a book from the Father and has authority, and all glory is given to Him uh, in worship as to the Father. It's a high uh, Christology text. He's divine as the Father. And, um, but if you look at the outline, sometimes it may not be just illusions that show you a framework, but the thematic outline. This outline, all uh, 11 points of it, actually it's, um, we'll go up here, it's, it's, it's really 13 points. Um, both visions, Daniel 7 and Revelation 4, 5, begin with the introductory vision, phraseology, the sitting, uh, of a setting of a throne in heaven. In fact, Daniel 7 is the only place where thrones are set up. It's the only place in all of Scripture. And you have the same here in Revelation. God sitting on the throne. Now, that occurs everywhere, all right, in, in apocalyptic like Isaiah 6. The description of God's appearance on the throne uh, begins to narrow down a little bit, Daniel 7. The parentheses are where these are found, both in Daniel and Revelation. There's fire before the throne, heavenly servants surrounding the throne, books before the throne. Now, that, that's absolutely unique. Uh, with Daniel 7 and Revelation 4 and 5. The opening of the book, the approach of a divine, because we, the, the, Jesus is presented as divine here, a divine messianic figure before God's throne to receive authority to reign forever and ever. Of course, it's the Lamb who is approaching the throne here, but He's a divine figure. And this phrase, to receive authority forever and ever, is, is really an allusion to Daniel 7, 14. Then... Uh, Number 10, this kingdom includes all peoples, nations, and tongues. That's a direct allusion right out of Daniel 7, 14. The seer, the, John's emotional distress on account of the vision. Uh, uh, the, uh, John's reception of heavenly counsel after his distress. And, um, and then at the end, the saints are given divine authority to reign over a kingdom. And that's an allusion to Daniel 7, 18 to 22. Uh, and then there's a concluding mention of God's eternal reign. There's something interesting just uh, in passing about this vision. And that is uh, in chapter 4, John sees a sea clear as crystal. I mean, it's just smooth. If you've ever been on a lake in Maine or somewhere, it's absolutely smooth. And, um, but Daniel 7 also has a sea, but it's being whipped here and there by the four winds of heaven, beasts arising out of it. And uh, with all of this, which I think is clearly from Daniel, maybe the sea is also from Daniel. But there's a difference. This one is not whipped by the wind out of which beasts arise. It's calmed. And it may refer to the fact that the Messiah has gone down into the depths, defeated the, the sea dragon in the depths of the sea uh, decisively at his death and resurrection, so that the readers, who if you read chapters 1 to 3, they're going through kind, different kinds of tribulation. They can know from the heavenly perspective. God's, give, God's giving them, John's giving them a heavenly perspective because they're in the midst of tribulation and the waves. They're, they're, head, they're barely above the waves of persecution and suffering. He's giving them a glimpse of the reality. If you persevere through it, you may be drowned, but you're going to overcome it just as Christ did. You, you may be gulped by the jaws of death, but so was Christ. You will overcome it. So persevere, ultimately the sea is calm, and you need to trust that. And, and that's hard. That's hard when you're about to die. But Jesus is about to Don't remember, you have a forerunner. Remember that. And it's amazing. And that's where perseverance comes from, that, that deep kind of theology and following the Lamb wherever He goes, Revelation 14, 4. So maybe, maybe the sea is, is, is from Daniel, but now it's calm. doesn't look like it is because it's crystal clear. And, and smooth. So it may be. So now what happens 
is within this Daniel 7 framework, and I, I would get excited about these things. I, talk, I remember talking to my wife about this sort of thing. And she'd say, well, so what difference does it make that it's a framework based on Daniel? So what? I said, oh, I said, I said, oh, yeah, I, I, I guess I better work on what does it mean. <laughs> in fact, often my transitions in teaching now is, so what difference does it make for the meaning and sometimes the application? And so she's helped me in that regard. So what difference does it make? Well, it means that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Son of Man. And the saints are the beginning fulfillment of the saints reigning right now. Because that, that, that vision in chapter 5 is he's made us a kingdom and priest. That's past going on into the present. And we are reigning on the earth. It's amazing. Now, some texts say you will reign on the earth. There's a textual problem there. Um, uh, it ultimately doesn't matter. I, I prefer the, uh, the present tense, you are reigning on the earth. It's a, it's a real tough one. But he's already said in the previous verse, you are a kingdom and priest. So, I mean, that's past. It's begun. He said that in one six as well. So, uh, Jesus is the beginning. His death and resurrection is the beginning fulfillment of Daniel 7. And that book represents the authority that's given to the Son of Man in uh, verses 13 to 14. Well, he'll, he'll rule over all peoples, nations, and tongues. So, that's begun. It's amazing. And we're identified with him. And as the saints who are suffering or drowning in persecution in chapters 1 to 3, as they identify with that, they can have strength. They'll overcome. In fact, that's why each letter begins with what? Nikao, the one who overcomes. It concludes that way. He who has an ear, let him hear, the one who overcomes. And he's promised a reward, which is identification with Christ. And uh, that's huge because uh, the last statement in um, uh, the letters is at the end of chapter 3 where, where it says uh, that, that if we... Uh, overcome, we will be seated on the throne with the Lamb who overcame. And, um, and then you go right into the vision. It goes into his, uh, the picture of his overcoming. So that's the interpretative difference, but you can also see it's, a, uh, it's an attempt here to build up confidence in those who, from the world's perspective, are, are failing, who are being defeated and suffering and persecution. But in fact, they are uh, um, really winning a victory with the Lamb just as his death looked like defeat. In reality, it was the beginning of a victory for even in the defeat, Christ was being a substitute for sin and ripping off the kingdom of the devil who didn't want people to overcome their sin but to hold them in captivity. And the resurrection is a further escalation of that ironic victory. Now, just to give you a glimpse at, at what else I do in this after presenting that uh, overview outline of Daniel 7 to show that Revelation is based on it, this is just one portion, which I've also given you. One example of how uh, New Testament writers will bring in other passages to supplement uh, uh, and to interpret the, the framework of Daniel 7. So you'll, you'll notice here, for example... Uh, Day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6.3. That's unique to Isaiah 6.3. So it's a, it's a probable illusion. Now, why would he draw that in to a Daniel 7 framework? Any ideas? For, you might remember uh, Isaiah 6. You know what? I wasn't going to say that, but that's amazing. That was the right answer. Even, even when I'm not expecting the answer, if you, if you say it, it will probably be correct. He's in the temple. He's in the temple. He is in the temple. And you'll notice what else is alluded to. Ezekiel. Anybody know what's going on in Ezekiel? What's the right answer? It's a, it's, a, it's a heavenly view of the temple in heaven. It's amazing. Yeah. And so, and we get again, the I, Isaiah 6 here, him who sits on the throne. And uh, so this, this, this is a vision of the temple. I didn't stress it as much in my dissertation because I wasn't a temple man then. All right. <laughs> I was not a member of the Knights Templar, if you will. Um, but exactly right. Thank you very much. It, it, this is a vision of the temple. 
And um, that's one reason he brings it in. The other is that uh, it's, it, th- th- this is a picture of uh, um, God on the throne. God's on the throne in Daniel 7. So thematically, even the, the theme and the picture uh, is attracted because, you know, you, you look at any, remember, any uh, wording, picture, or theme that's, that's uniquely similar then that becomes a hermeneutical magnet that pulls in these other things to interpret it. And uh, especially, it's not as clear, I have to say. Some argue that the Daniel 7 theophany scene that, that we talked about, we'll look more at it, uh, about the Son of Man in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Some have said it's a temple scene. I think it probably is, but it's not as clear. Um, so, yeah. So just on processing this the right way, so as John is writing this in Revelation, Four and five. Yeah. He's got Daniel seven in his mind, but as he thinks about this temple scene or this mm-hmm. Roman scene, Isaiah six is just there too. I mean, it's, yeah. It's just not Let me be precise because this is something that bothered my wife. I mean, she's she's an exegete, and uh, though she doesn't have a seminary education, but um, she said, you know, Greg, it sounds like you're saying that all of this is just composed by John, and it's not a vision. That's interesting. So how do we work with that? And there's a debate in Revelation studies. Some think every, it's all just composition. He just created these visions, didn't have them. Others think uh, who, 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 very, very conservative people uh, that all he's doing is writing the vision. That's all he's doing. He just he writes it down. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the middle. He has these visions. But these visions are intended by God, like this one, to be similar to Daniel 7. Okay? God intended that connection. I say, why wouldn't God use his own plain words? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, so, and I think John realizes it, and I think in recording this vision, there are some things that may be hard to describe. Well, what better way to record the vision than to go back to the earlier visions that are recorded and to use that wording? So I think it's both and. It's not either or. And, and even those who study Jewish apocalyptic think probably these apocalyptists had dreams and dreams of Scripture. I mean, I, if you've had dreams, you're immersed in Scripture, uh, you probably, uh, uh, you know, you probably, it's because you're saturated with Scripture. I mean, the, these Jews were saturated with Scripture. So, you know, I've known people that take intensive Hebrew in the summer and they dream in Hebrew sometimes. I, it's that kind of thing. And so it's, it's like that. And I've heard that the Puritans, the early uh, stages of this country, uh, their whole daily language was filled with scriptural language. And so it's that sort of thing. So that even people, even scholars, believe that the Jewish apocalyptists, who were not the biblical writers, that they had these visions to one degree or another and wrote them down and then supplemented them by going to scripture. And so this, this is the human aspect. I mean, Scripture is fully human, right? right. It's also fully divine. And uh, what it means is that while it's fully human, it's not fully fallen human, all right? Uh, God's uh, uh, superintendents caused them not to make but errors. If you think about it, especially uh, Jews that were really devout towards the memorization of Scripture. Yeah. It's great. You know, you know what I mean? It doesn't, yeah. It's not by intention a lot of times. It's by Neat. nature. Oh, that's it great. It come through because it's been in your I love that. Your thinking. That's great. That's great. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah, I think so. So um, so he brings these things in. Well, Daniel uh, 4.34, after Nebuchadnezzar's been humbled and after he's been uh, uh, raised back from being a beast, he praises God. And part of it is it's the God who lives forever and ever. Uh, Daniel 4.34. So how appropriate to bring that in from the nearby context of Daniel. And he repeats it again right down here in verse 10. So that's a good example of, of, of how this whole vision is shot through with other texts, but they're brought in to supplement interpretatively this, um, this particular text. And uh, yesterday I mentioned to you Revelation 13. Remember we looked at the beast there in Revelation 13. This is a text based only on Daniel 7. And um, you'll notice here, again, the, this column is, is, is a highly probable illusion, probable and then uh, a possible illusion. 
But here um, you can see, um, see yeah, uh, there was given to him a mouth speaking great things. Well, that's what's said about the horn in Daniel 7, 6. Authority was given to him to act for 42 months, Daniel 7, 6 again. He opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, Daniel 7, 25. His tabernacle, those who are in heaven, or, uh, is um, uh, who is blasphemed. And in Daniel 8, 10, uh, uh, there, there are those in heaven who are attacked, okay? It says the saints. There's a debate about whether they're angels, whether they're saints. I actually think they're angels that represent saints on the earth. There's a corporate identification. That's why, by the way, John addresses each of the seven letters to an angel. Some think, oh, this is the messenger of the letters. It could be because they were always, uh, uh, Paul would send a messenger. Okay, it could be, it could be. But everywhere else in Revelation, after chapter 3, the, the uh, angelos, angeloi, are always angels in heaven. I think he's addressing angels, and uh, the reason I do is because they represent the church. And, um, and so the church is addressed through their corporate representatives, and I think it's done that way partly so that the church will realize their help comes from heaven and, and not from themselves. Um, so it was given him, this antichrist figure, to make war with the saints, overcome them. That's, that's a quotation from Daniel 7, 21. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Well, that's, that's what's said of the Son of Man in Daniel 7, 14. But he's got it. Uh, if you remember, there's a, a, a satanic trinity in Revelation 13, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So they're mimicking. So this, th this text here, spoken of the Messiah, he tries to become uh, what the Son of Man was. And that, that's, what, that, that's why the uh, beast is called 666. It's just ad infinitum, never reaches seven, never reaches perfection, even when they try to imitate... Uh, the Messiah. Yes, yeah, the number of man. That's right. Created in the sixth day. So 666. Um, <clears throat> that, that number is also found in the amount of gold that was six, sent to Solomon. 666, I think, pounds of gold. And Solomon, that's the turning point for him that goes downward in sin. And it's economic. And that's just what this is in Revelation 13. Um, <clears throat> this last one down here... Uh, in verse 8, whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world. That's from Daniel 12, 1 and 2 and Psalm 69. So you can see uh, most of this is actually from Daniel 7. This time it is not an outline, though. This time it's so saturated with Daniel 7 allusions and quotations that you can conclude, yeah, that's what's dominating his thought here. So you can discern a template or a prototype or blueprint either by the saturation of allusions or... A, an outline or both. Now, this happens outside the book of Revelation. And so, if you notice here... Yeah. And yeah. A quick question before we leave the book yeah. of Revelation. Yeah. Um, so, I'm guessing we're going to kind of bump some up here. Watch here. Uh, well, she's, uh, she's my better half, so you'll well, probably make the class better. What, what, um, so, you encounter this, you're going to preach this, got to go back and survey what's happening in Daniel 7. Like, right, exactly. How, how is Daniel, so can you give me like that and like a, maybe a paragraph? What is what is happening in Daniel 7 as far as if we turn to the rest of Daniel? Because I'm, yeah. my Daniel isn't sharp right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, obviously chapters 1 through 6 are basically historical narrative. Mm -hmm. But chapter 2 uh, is about four kingdoms. The last will be destroyed. And God will set up his kingdom. Okay. Uh, stone cut out without hands smashes the uh, statue, and it grows, and it fills the earth. Okay. Um, and a number of commentators, of which I am one, believes that that's more than coincidental because there are four beasts who are kingdoms in Daniel 7. And then the Son of Man comes, replaces them, and he rules the whole earth. So I think that this is another version uh, developing Daniel 2. So most of it's historical, but you then have that apocalyptic blip in it, if you will. It's still within the historical because Nebuchadnezzar is talking about his dream, but it's an apocalyptic dream. Mm -hmm. 
in the beginning of chapter 7, it gets really weird. I mean, visions and uh, for me, chapter 7 is easier than, than a lot of the rest. But um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the bottom line is, again, that, that John is perceiving in this case, in chapter 13, uh, uh, the description of the powers of evil uh, the readers ought to see are, uh, uh, it's been prophesied. Mm-hmm. And that, that's why he says, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear, at the very, really around verse 9 or so in chapter 13. And then a little later, after he gives the number of the beast, he says, he who has a mind, let him calculate the number. And so, let me, let me just get that, get that right. Um, that's one of the phrases, 13. Right? Yeah. And earlier, uh, in, verse, in the verse 10, uh, let's see, no, forget it. Yeah, beginning at verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And so it doesn't mean if you have a physical ear, it's a spiritual ear. And what's he to hear? This is prophesied by Daniel. It's expected. Don't let it be unexpected for you. Like 1 Peter 4 says, uh, uh, you know, these fiery trials come upon you. Don't, don't, don't let them disturb you because, you, you know, the devil's going to do that. And so this is know your Bible. I'm trying to help you with it. And this is expected. And in Daniel 11, it says that those who really know God will persevere. Those who don't, are called hypocrites, and they compromise with the beast and are willing to worship idols. Mm-hmm. And, of course, idolatry is a problem in Revelation. And so he's trying to prepare them to be strong. And how are they strong? By knowing Scripture. In this case, the prophetic design. Mm-hmm. And they're in the midst of it. They're in the midst of this. But that, that also ought to make them realize, you know, that God is sovereign. He's predicted it. And he's going to eventually bring them out of it one way or another. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I think that's the... That's a so what, which is both meaning and application. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, that, was, that was good. Now, th- but you also find these frameworks in um, uh, Mark uh, 13, for example. I'm, I'm showing you now some excerpts from a book by a guy named Lars Hartman. I don't have it written there, but his last name is Hartman, and his book is called Prophecy Interpreted. Prophecy Interpreted. Interpreted, and in this book, um, um, you know, Hart- Hartman's not an evangelical. He's from the University of Uppsala. He's died some years ago, but um, uh, he he's written a very good book here. And um, what he does, he goes through every most of the verses, most of the chapter in Mark 13, and all he does in a very manual labor way is show the quotations and allusions to Daniel. You'll notice the first one down here. Um, I'll expand this. Some of these are thematic allusions. So uh, many will say, I am, and the horn magnifies itself. Daniel 7. Some of these illusions you might question. Some may be less probable than others. Uh, as, he, as he goes on, um, let's see if we can get it all. Yeah. Notice. So the, uh, the wars and the rumors of wars, uh, th- th- this whole uh, theme of wars is found in these texts in Daniel. Remember this one? The beasts will make war with the saints and overcome them. Um, uh, this must take place. Well, that phrase, hadeganestai, comes right out of Daniel 2.28 and following in, in the Greek Old Testament which is a rendering of the, of the Aramaic. So that, that's actually a, a very clear allusion. 
Uh, then you get some other texts, Chronicles, Isaiah. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but uh, you know, we're not going to look them up. But uh, I just want you to see the saturation. I think probably most are valid. Some I would question. Um, and so um, uh, the delivering up refers to the prophecy of the saints being delivered up to the beast. You get references to Isaiah 19, uh, Micah 7.2, Micah 7.6, uh, number of texts, Micah, which is very interesting. Um, and then it continues here. Uh, he who endures to the end will be saved. That idea of enduring and not compromising comes right out of Daniel 11 here. Uh, and enduring to the end it will be saved. It says that they will be delivered at the beginning of Daniel 12 and delivered through resurrection. Um, the abomination of desolation is an actual quotation virtually from Daniel chapter uh, 11, 9, 27, and 12, 11. It's mentioned three times. Um, intriguingly, Genesis 19, 7, uh, Exodus 16, and this idea of, of a great tribulation down here comes right out of Daniel 12, 1. Okay, um, so uh, basically what you have here, let's see if there are any others that are interesting, um, yeah, you have um, the idea of false prophets, and of course that's what uh, uh, this, this pseudo prophetic king is in Daniel 11, and he gathers those who have compromised with him on his team, to th and then sends them out to try to get others to compromise. And uh, that's what's going on, I think, right here, and to lead them astray. So you can see a number of other texts that are brought in, but uh, I think this text is, is modeled, Mark 13, I think, is modeled on Daniel 7 through 12, not just on one chapter, but on that broad context. And then you have other verses that are brought in. So... Uh, be aware of that as, as you're interpreting Scripture. Um, I do have the climax of this vision uh, right here, which uh, is, is, is very significant. More, more text from Isaiah uh, and Zechariah. Remember the, the, the tribe's mourning uh, from Zechariah? The Son of Man in clouds of great power and glory. Well, that, that, that's quotation from 9, 7, 13 to 14. Very clear. And then some other text. And so um, this text model, is modeled broadly on Daniel 7 through 12. Again, we could ask, so what? Well, what Hartman talked about, first of all, was that many people uh, believe that, as one of you mentioned yesterday, that the Gospels uh, are really interspersed significantly with the words of the later church. They would, uh, when, when the Gospels are written, uh, maybe as early as the 60s, some think even up on into the 80s, uh, Gospel of John in the 90s, which I agree with, no problem there. Um, but it's the time of the church and the time when the Holy Spirit is working, and so some scholars say, well, the Holy Spirit really uh, is the prophet spoke, and they, they would talk about what Jesus did and said, then that would get put back into uh, the Gospels, even though... Um, uh, it really didn't happen, and even though maybe he really didn't say it, okay? Because uh, Jesus now is speaking through those prophets, so hey, let's record that word and put it somewhere in the Gospels, okay? And so Hartman is fighting against that. He said this, this is not something composed by the church or, or by others. If you took the parallels in Matthew 24 to Mark 13 and Luke 21... Okay, they're very, very similar. If you uh, took them and you uh, tried to see references to Daniel in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, you really would not see them. And um, what this does is uh, this chart puts together not just Mark, but what Matthew and Luke have. When you put them all together, it's very clear that Daniel 7 13, to 13 uh, is 
um, that Daniel 7 to 12 is in mind. You can't see it as well if you look at each one independently, but you put them all together because there's the same discourse. And he said what that shows is the likelihood that probably there is one person who spoke that discourse. Mark gets some of it. He's selective. Matthew's selective, and so was Luke. Put them all together, and you see the full discourse. He says that that points to a historical uh, individual discourse, not put together, you know, haphazardly or anyway by someone later in the church. So it's a very interesting thesis in that, in, in that regard, but it also shows that Jesus thought in terms of frameworks. He, 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 he would model uh, whole discourses uh, on, on, on Daniel or on other Old Testament texts. Now, there are other kinds of Midrashic frameworks, and this is one here. And it's your next page. You should have this. And uh, this is Romans 9 through 11. I can't get it all on here. But you'll notice that the check marks, the check marks represent allusions to the Old Testament in those corresponding verses or quotations that are directly restoration prophecies. Okay? The dashes right here represent that these verses are not directly themselves restoration prophecies, but they're in close context to them. Whereas the, the, the uh, zeros here, or the O's, represent passages which have nothing to do even in its context with the restoration promise. There are not very much of them, and it would be interesting to try to inquire why has this been pulled in. But this is not a framework based on one Old Testament segment. This is a thematic framework. He has the restoration of Israel in mind. So he has that as his framework, and then he looks at texts from the Old Testament about restoration okay, and brings them in. So you can have a scriptural, uh, uh, an actual textual framework, or... Uh, a scriptural thematic framework. In this case, it's restoration. What does that mean? Romans 9 through 11 is about the restoration of Israel, however you interpret it. Okay. Of course, Romans 11, 26 is the difficult one, and in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Um, for myself, I think this is both about the restoration of Israel, but the church is true Israel. Um, but I won't go into that. If you want to talk about Romans 11, maybe over a meal or something, we could do that. Um, another example of this framework I mentioned to you yesterday when we were talking about uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And I talked about this common wording that showed this was an allusion to uh, the new creation prophecy in Corinthians. You notice what I've underlined here. Uh, uh, ta prota, ta archaia, um, and... Um, uh, Kaina and Indu, all these are verbally. Here you got Kaina, Indu, and uh, Ta Archaea. Uh, ta Prota would be synonymous with Ta Archaea. And um, the Gaganan have come about would be synonymous with Poieo, make. So uh, it's highly probable that this is an allusion to both these texts here, new creation texts from Isaiah. But once, as I said yesterday, when you look at Isaiah 40 to 66, these are these new creation prophecies are part of what would happen at the end time restoration of Israel. And, um, but then I kept going um, and found these allusions. Most of them are found in the margins of Nessel Alon. And all of these are allusions, every one of them, to the restoration of Israel. And uh, so this led me to think, well, beginning at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all the way up to perhaps 7, 6, Paul has in mind the restoration of Israel. Now, the so what of that, there are a lot of applications of it, by the way. For example, if you're a new creation, do you live like a new creation? New creations should begin budding, perhaps slowly but surely, with fruit. Are you bearing fruit in your life? And if not, you need to examine yourself, as Paul says at the end of uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 13, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. That's pretty practical. But also, uh, some think that 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18, 
was an interpolation by some other author and not Paul. It's a very, very wide popular uh, opinion up until the mid-80s, 1980s. And so I wrote an article in New Testament Studies called The Old Testament Background of Reconciliation <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 5, um, uh, 17 through 7, 6. And I argued that throughout the whole thing, you can see in, 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 in 6, 17 through 18, the section that's supposed to be an interpolation by some other author by Paul. No, that's right. It's part of this restoration from Israel thing. And so it makes sense. This would be just one author. It's Paul. Um, these, these kind of proposals by people, you might, you might wonder, why do they make them in the first place? And uh, most, most of these people are um, not people with a high view of Scripture. Um, uh, to show you another uh, midrashing framework, when I was at Wheaton, uh, a fellow by the name of Matt Harmon, uh, did a dissertation called uh, She Must and Shall Go Free, Paul's Isianic Gospel in Galatians. It's published in uh, this series here um, from Berlin and um, in 2010. But just to show you, you have that before you. Um, he, uh, he goes through all the verses and shows all the Isaiah references. The, the one... The ones that are uh, clearest allusions, he has A for allusion. Uh, the um, echoes, he has E. And then others uh, are, are not so clear. Um, I think he's probably right. But once you start basing things also on echoes, I get a little uncomfortable. I'd be a lot more comfortable if he had a lot more A's here. I'm not sure there are enough A's to show that this is a framework on Isaiah. I'd love to believe it. And I'm, I, I, maybe when I see him and he'll write a little more on this, I, I can be convinced. I'm not quite convinced. This is done under Douglas Moo, though. Moo is no slouch. So, um, uh, But this is a, it's a possibility, just to show you. But it's very interesting. If that's the case, then... Uh, all of Galatians is to be interpreted in the light of Isaiah 40 to 66. And he certainly brings in other passages. And certainly the clearest, the clearest reference in the Old Testament in Galatians is in chapter 4. And it's in the passage that I've given you to do one of your possible, possible for one of the uh, papers. And uh, that's the clearest Old Testament quotation in all of Galatians. Uh, so, so you may be right. Okay. Illusion, an, uh, an illusion is something where the verbal parallel and thematic is just really clear. And how do you know it's clear? It only occurs in your New Testament text and in the Old Testament text. If it occurs a lot in 20 Old Testament texts, well, yeah, I don't, you know, maybe you can say, well, collectively he's aware of that general theme. You could say that, I guess. Um, but if it's unique, the more unique it is, the more probable both in theme and wording. An echo is something that, you know, you're, you're, I think I hear where it's coming from. You know, think of an echo, you know. I mean, if, if, you know, it's, I'm, I'm hearing echoes. Is this really it, you know? Now, what's confused people about the relation between and the distinction between uh, an illusion and an echo is um, Richard Hayes' works called Echoes of Scripture and Paul. Now he's come out with a new book, Echoes of Scripture and the Gospels. And um, in, that, in that first book, Echoes of Scripture and Paul, he'll talk about echoes sometimes as illusions and sometimes as just possible illusions. But he uses the same word. And it's, that's, that's confusing. I hope he doesn't do that in his new book because that was, that was confusing. So both are very good books. Well, I haven't read the other, but I've read a condensation of the Gospel book. So... Okay, uh, let's go now to the next use. What, what number are we on? Yeah. Textual use of the Old Testament. Okay, yes. So would, uh, okay, Psalm 95 used by the Hebrew author of Hebrews be this use, this midrash framework where he brings it up a couple of different times over those kind of long passages of three and yeah. four? And it may be. I, I, I'd have to study that. Okay. Quite frankly, I haven't studied that as carefully. It's possible. I'd have to see, you know, if it um, is used enough. And then if the thematic, maybe there are other unique themes there 
that are in common with Psalm 95, then that may be a possibility. I mean, I'm not giving you all the frameworks. I mean, there are plenty of scripture I haven't, haven't had time to investigate in this depth. And uh, um, uh, I'm also trying to present others who have investigated other uh, segments in depth. But, um, but that's, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe. We'd have to see. Um, but that's, that's interesting. All right. Textual use of the Old Testament. Okay? What number are we on, did you say? Ten. Now, this is a text from the book of Revelation. And it's about where um, Babylon's going to be destroyed by the beast. And uh, it speaks of these beasts. And it says um, that these have one purpose and the power and the authority of them, uh, uh, their power and authority they give to the beast. Then verse 14, these, these beasts, which represent political figures, kings, the beast is their authority, these beasts will make war with the lamb and the lamb, Nikese, will overcome them because Curios, Curion, Estin, Kai, Basilus, Basile, On. Anybody want to translate that? Because Lord of Lords He is and King of Kings. And with Him, uh, 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 yeah, the ones with Him, the call, the elect, and the faithful. So this is an end time battle in which, in which Christ is going to win. And He's called. Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Uh, you'll notice in the margin a number of texts, Deuteronomy, the Psalm, Daniel 2.47, some extra-biblical texts, Maccabees, Enoch, 3rd Maccabees. And usually these texts will have, you know, uh, Lord of Lords and King of Kings or, um, sorry, um, uh, King of Kings and God of Gods or Lord of Lords and God of Gods, they won't have the exact phrase. None of these represent uh, this full phrase. So in this case, if this is all we had, I said, well, maybe these are echoes. Okay? But in fact, as I was doing my research in Daniel, I found this. I'm reading the Old Greek of Daniel. Remember, there are two versions of Daniel. There's the Old Greek and there's Theodosian. When you look up in the Septuagint, you'll see the page split in half, okay? Because there are two versions. And that happens in the books of Samuel, for example, and in, in, in other books. So be aware of that. Don't get confused. Now, here we have the Nebuchadnezzar is uh, praising God after he has been um, lifted from captivity to being a beast and eating the grass of the field. This is part of his praise now. By the way, if you notice... Uh, th this comes, that this is verse 37, uh, but in the Masoretic text it's verse 34. So it's one thing irritating about the Aramaic or Hebrew text compared to the English. Sometimes you get different versifications. It's quite irritating. So you have to be aware of that. Be careful. Um, Which version are we looking at here? We are looking at the Old Greek. Okay? The Old Greek. And so Nebuchadnezzar is you know, praising the God who made the heaven, the earth, and the seas, and the rivers, and all things in them. By the way, notice that this verse is split into verse 37, which is right here, verse 37a, verse 37b, and onwards. This is what you call a living Bible expansion. One verse is expanded into all of that. that, that that's pretty amazing. But it's a good example of what some call midrash. Midrash is a very uh, a fuzzy word in biblical studies. Uh, it has to do with the way the Jews interpreted Scripture. Its most basic meaning is uh, uh, comparing one Scripture with another to interpret it. And that's why I called what we just were looking at midrashic frameworks. Um, so that's its most basic meaning, interpreting Scripture by Scripture. Um, but... Um, uh, there, there, there are different uh, interpretations. Some would say, well, it's about the application of Scripture. Um, well, we'll leave it at that. But sometimes in, in Midrashic interpretation, there's a big blow-up. 
big expansion. And boy, you sure have that here. In this expansion, notice what, Nebu- how, uh, what is part of Nebuchadnezzar's praise. He says, I confess and praise that he himself is God of gods, so he includes that Lord of lords and King of kings, because he does signs and wonders and, and uh, other times and uh, uh, seasons and times, uh, uh, upseating, taking uh, away uh, uh, the kingdom of kings. Um, so, and seating others on them. So, um, this occurs nowhere else. This occurs only right here, and it does occur um, in that uh, passage that I just mentioned to you here. Actually, it does occur in this uh I believe in this Enoch text. By the way, you see Hen, they'll give sometimes the abbreviations in German, so that's Enoch. But in Enoch, uh, you do find uh, a reference to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but he's probably alluding back to Daniel. Okay? Now remember that this is Nebuchadnezzar who's been made a beast, and now he's praising the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who is Yahweh. But in our text, Jesus is Lord of Lords and king of kings. And it has to do with the same context. In, in that earlier context, Babylon the Great is mentioned, which is uttered by Nebuchadnezzar. And he was made a beast. And so Jesus is going to overcome the beast just as God overcame Nebuchadnezzar. And it's a high Christology text. He is Yahweh who does, the, does this. But this is a textual use. This is not found in the canonical text of Daniel anywhere. And, uh, and, but it's an expansion from Daniel 4. He doesn't uh, uh, allude to other texts here. He could allude to later when it says, and, you know, God unseats kings from their kingdoms and he puts others in their place. He could have done that, but he doesn't. Uh, and he could have used the actual wording only of Daniel uh, uh, 4.34. Uh, let, me, let me give you that wording. Um, Daniel 4.34, he says... I raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High, praised and honored Him who lives forever, for His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. So that's all expanded into this, and he adds in the midst of it, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who will defeat the Babylonian beast at the end of time. Now, another example, uh, which is interesting, this is not technically a textual use, but I wanted to talk about it to show you the, uh, some of the interesting things that the uh, Greek Old Testament does. This, again, is the Old Greek, and below it, you can see, is Theodotion. So the Old Greek, here's what Theodotion has. Theodotion's uh, much more of what we might call a formal, formal equivalent translation. It gets as close as it can, kind of like New American Standard does to the the Hebrew and the Greek. And so it says, uh, he records uh, on on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And heos, up to the ancient of days, he came. Came and received authority. So we have, he came up to the ancient of days. Notice what the Greek Old Testament does. He comes on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, he came, and hos, the ancient of days, he came. What's the difference between heos, up to, and hos? Yeah, my, what a difference an epsilon makes. Here he's divine, okay? And uh, th- there's some debate about whether this was an accidental error, just a scribal error, maybe, uh, maybe somehow um, he- uh, the, the epsilon dropped out. Most commentators, regardless of their theological bent, agree this, this, this was an intentional change. Why? Probably because 
This figure comes on the clouds. The only other person that comes on clouds in the Old Testament is Yahweh. It's God. And so probably he's trying to draw that out a little bit. Does this happen anywhere else in the uh, uh, New Testament? Well, we come close in Revelation chapter 1 where in the vision, John has a vision uh, of one like a son of man. In verse 13, clothed to the feet, girded across the chest with a golden girdle. And then it says, his head and his hair white as white wool as snow. Now, in my margin, you notice that um, there's a reference to uh, Daniel 7, and um, it's, it's a reference to the Ancient of Days, whose hair was white as snow. So, you do find uh, here um, that the Son of Man is attributed descriptions, uh, portrayals, which in Daniel 7 were of the Ancient of Days. Um, so this is not an actual use of this particular text, but it does compare him to the Ancient of Days here. And John's doing the same thing, and so um, certainly what he is doing is in line with not only the Aramaic text, which has already implied that he's divine with the coming on clouds, but he may have been aware of this, what we might call an interpretative tradition, uh, commentary by the LXX, which is the earliest commentary in the Old Testament. I once had a friend who was um, uh, finishing his oral his, his, his comprehensive exams at the University of Chicago in Old Testament and ancient, ancient Near East. And on his uh, exam, one of the questions was, what's the earliest commentary on the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew Old Testament? It's, it's the Greek Old Testament. So he may have been aware of this exegetical tradition. If not, both authors are thinking in the same way. So, um, all right. Um, No, I don't think either one. I think that Theodosian is just being strictly according to the Aramaic, which says he came up to. The old Greek has decided to interpret that, and he's saying he came hosts, came as the Ancient of Days. So they're just re they're, they're, it's just like two English Bibles. They might interpret differently, okay? And so the, the, the Old Testament Greek makes it more explicit that the Son of Man is divine, whereas the um, Theodosian doesn't make it as explicit, okay? And John makes it explicit here in, in Revelation chapter 1 in the vision of the Son of Man. Now, there's another text, and uh, you don't necessarily need to turn there, but it's this text here. And um, let's see if we can reduce it a little. I don't know if you have that or not. I can't remember. Is that in your packet? No? Okay. Well, you got it up here. So, um, this is an example of the textual use of the Old Testament. It's a classic example. First of all, in Revelation 3.14, Jesus is identifying himself. He's the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, that itself... The letters really are expanding on the initial vision in chapter 1. And he's doing that. How so? Well, faithful witness becomes the amen, the faithful and true witness. Okay? He wants to expand on that. When it says in, in verse 5 that he's firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, he wants to expand on that. So firstborn from the dead here probably becomes the beginning of the creation of God. Okay? Because resurrection is new creation in the New Testament. So that's an amazing, uh, that's a clear expansion. Uh, this is an amazing interpretation of the resurrection here. It's the beginning of the creation of God. But not only is he interpretatively developing chapter 1 of Revelation, he's developing it 
by exegeting it with the Old Testament. This is amazing. So look at this. Here in Isaiah 65, 17, it twice speaks of the God of Amen, the God of Amen. And uh, some early Greek Bibles have the God of Amen, some have the true God, some have the faithful God. And we're going to look a little more at that. So that Amen, faithful and true, in developing the faithful witness, uh, by the way, faithful witness comes out of Psalm 89. It characterizes the Davidic Messiah's reign. Um, so he's already alluding the Old Testament here. And, and he, he expands that one Old Testament text by interpreting it by other Old Testament texts, which is Isaiah 65, 16, and 17. And, um, and what's amazing, just focusing on Amen here, uh, there's only, you have it throughout the Old Testament, but only one time does Amen refer to a person and, and, and not the conclusion of a prayer or something like that. And it's Isaiah 65 where God is the God of Amen. This is not the conclusion to a prayer. He's the God of Amen. He's faithful. That's what Amen means. Amen. And so, so this is a high Christology text. He is that God of Isaiah. And uh, notice, just as Isaiah 65, 17, uh, after verse 16, which is Amen twice, it concludes with, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Is it accidental that this concludes with Christ is the beginning of the new creation? I don't think it's coincidental. So uh, he is interpreting his resurrection from chapter 1 and verse 5, firstborn from the dead. He's interpreting that by Isaiah 65 and, and saying that's the beginning of the new creation. And, of course, that's just what Paul says, doesn't he, in 2 Corinthians 5, that Christ died, we died. He rose, we've risen with him, so that if anyone is in Christ, a new creation. Old things have passed away, new things have come. So that the, uh, uh, our resurrection is seen as the beginning of the new creation in Isaiah 65. And actually, the reason for that is because we come into union with Christ when we first believe. If He's the beginning of the new creation and His resurrection, so are we. Now, let's look further at this. This is still under this heading. Uh, these are supposed to be examples of the uh, textual use of the Old Testament. And um, I'm going to show you uh, this. This is a and I'll show it to you in the library as well. This is called Origins Hexapla. What it does, it gives you the Hebrew. And it gives you the Latin translation of the Hebrew. And this symbol means the, uh, what we might call the standard Greek Old Testament of the time. Okay? And that particular text has the true God. In Hebrew, it's Amen, Amen. Okay? It interprets it by true. And that is a positive. If you looked at how uh, Alethanos uh, is used in the Greek Old Testament, it will sometimes uh, translate Amen. But likewise, A stands for Aquila. That's a particular later recension and addition, if you will, of the Greek Old Testament, around 125 A.D. But it has stuff in it that comes from earlier, okay? So the, the reviser is using uh, interpretative traditions on the Old Testament and sometimes expanding it. So uh, here's what Aquila has. Uh, he has... Uh, the faithful God. Literally, this is an adverb, but it's talking about uh, uh, um, he will be blessed by God faithfully, the faithful God. So, so you have a form of pistuo here, uh, faithful. And then uh, Symmachus, that capital uh, sigma, uh, written later in the first century, maybe 170, 80, um, just renders it literally. He's a literal interpreter of the Hebrew. So he just has Amen. So what's happened here? I think, so the, the, by the way, the, the help of Fields Hexapla, it'll give you significant variance. It'll only state 
the variants for you. When, when the, the Greek only is just very literal, it just leaves it alone. But when you have variants like this, it'll stay. So that's, that's very interesting. I'll show you that in the library tour today because it's something you ought to be aware of. Um, so basically, if we were to summarize here, why does Jesus expand this statement? He's expanding it, by the way. Christ is the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness. I think he wants to expand the God of Amen and that initial statement in 1.5 of Revelation, the faithful witness, he wants to interpret it. The Jews that were good interpreters, the apostles and Jesus, they interpret Scripture by Scripture. And uh, these different renderings of Amen uh, represent different Bibles. Basically, that's all they represent, different Bibles. It's the Hebrew that's inspired. Remember, not even the LXX is, is, is inspired, though there's debate and we can talk about that. Uh, Greek Orthodox believe it was inspired, the, the Greek and not the Hebrew, intriguingly. Um, so uh, what Jesus does is he pulls all of these together to expand uh, the Amen uh, of, of, of God. Now, uh, could John have added one or two? Maybe. It's possible that he could have expanded that on the inspiration of the Spirit because we find that in parallels in the Gospels that statements of Jesus are a little different. Not contradictory, but some are expanded, some are shortened. And so the Gospel writers do that. Could John have done it? Yeah. I don't think there's any reason to uh, think, though, that uh, Jesus, who's speaking in vision here, did it himself. And... Uh, and, and, and why? So what difference does it make? He's just trying to make it even clearer. There's a connection with Isaiah. And for those of you who are familiar with the versions, may not have been everybody, but some, this, this connects this even more with Isaiah, and, uh, and, and which, which affirms further and underscores further that Christ is the God of Amen. That's amazing. Um, so... Um, uh, that, that, I think, is an example of the textual use. Of, think about John 14, 14. I mean, he is pointing out over and over again, Jesus is the God. Yeah, it's amazing. The I am, the amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. Do you have this? No. I think you do. Look in your, let me see your packet. Keep going. Oh, is that it? Let me see. Oh, still have it. Let's see. Okay. Don't have it. Okay, that's all right. I'm going to put this on. You will find this, by the way, in Johnson's little book. He has a chapter on this. So if you want to go copy this, you can copy a couple of pages out of Johnson. Now let's look at this. I think this is another example of the textual use of the Old Testament. So, that, by the way, this is something that would overlap with other uses. I mean, you might find that something is an uh, indirect typological fulfillment, but the way it's stated, there's a further interpretative expansion by using maybe the Greek Old Testament or one of its versions that we looked at, like Symmachus or Aquila or um, Theodosian, um, so that this can overlap with some of the others, okay? So you can identify indirect fulfillment of prophecy, but it may be uh, interpreted textually by some others to, to expand the interpretation. That's why an author, I think, would... Wh why would an author be dependent on, say, a Greek Old Testament and not the Hebrew? I think to expand the interpretation. Um, and uh, if that troubles some people... Um, uh, it doesn't mean, for example, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, does, does that make that scriptural back in Daniel 4? No. It makes it scriptural in, Daniel, in, in, in Revelation 17, okay? doesn't mean that it is from there because we know, in fact, in Acts 17, that uh, Paul can refer to Zeus by referring to two pagan poets who are stating attributes of God they have a common grace understanding. Paul takes it and makes it, makes it a special grace, special revelatory understanding. But he quotes pagan poets. 
Is, is that kind of what's going on with uh, translation for the mom? Where you, I mean, I, I started comparing the different yeah. Septuagints, and it seems like the Revelation passages come in and kind of expanded, expanded things. Let's leave that for tomorrow. Okay. Where, well, that's okay. I mean, I, I, I just as you said it, it made me think that. Maybe, yeah. We'll have to address that one tomorrow. Here, let's look at the problem. Uh, okay, you see, you see that okay? Uh-huh. Or not? All right, Revelation. Uh, <clears throat> Um, chapter 19, as well as 227, okay, has this, and it comes out of Psalm 2. He, Christ, will shepherd them with a rod of iron, okay, he'll shepherd them with a rod of iron, and that's what 227 says as well. Psalm 29, in the Greek Old Testament, has, you will shepherd them with a rod of iron, okay, the Hebrew has, you will smite them with a rod of iron. Not shepherd, you'll smite. Now, notice, in Hebrew, the word for smite is ra'ah, okay, ra'ah. The word for shepherd is ra'ah. Well, they're similar, but now notice. The second person um, singular of this verb in Hebrew for smite is teroaim. For the verb shepherd, it's tiraim. Notice that they're exactly the same with regard to their consonants because the, the, the name is them um, and that this represents the you. And so in this shortened form, smite and shepherd are spelled exactly the same in the second person singular. Exactly the same. Only difference are the dots. Vowel points, and those uh, vowel points represent our vowels. Okay, so they are different words. So oral tradition from the Old Testament was carried on, and they had the vowel points in their tradition. It was not until like the fourth century, roughly, uh, uh, that the Masoretes put in the vowel points. S- most of the time they're fine, but sometimes they might have gotten it wrong. So. Now, G.B. Caird, who has good commentary on Revelation, he's not evangelical. Uh, he has a good book um, on uh, uh, the, the metaphors of Scripture. Very good book, published by Duckworth Press, uh, not a well-known press. But, but he, he taught at Cambridge. I mean, sorry, he, he taught at um, Oxford. He was actually my external examiner on my dissertation. still remember that. I was sitting on one side of a table and my two examiners on the other. It was a hot June day. And I, I had to take my glasses off because they were fogging up. I was so nervous so, <laughs> at any rate. Um, so, Caird says, you know, this is John. He's mindlessly dependent on the Greek Old Testament, which was his Bible. He just goes with shepherd. Okay? You can see, this is aligned with the LXX, right? If you were doing a paper on this, you'd say it's aligned with the LXX. And... So what difference does it make? Kerr said he just made an error. Because the Hebrew has, you'll break them, smite them with a rod of iron. Okay? It's a different Hebrew word. The LXX made the mistake. Understood it as shepherd instead of smite. Just read the vowel points wrong. And, um, and so John mindlessly depends on the LXX. He got it wrong. So Kerr takes that route. But I think that's a little premature for myself. Um, Here are some 
other options uh, that, that I think would be very, very viable. Um, one other solution is this, that we, f we find that the Greek Old Testament sometimes, perhaps sometimes not unusually, but it's something to keep aware of. It's, 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 it's enough significant, happens enough that you need to be aware of it, that the Greek Old Testament preserves the original and the MT, the Hebrew's been corrupted. Okay, good. The Hebrew's not perfect. I mean, it's only the original autographs that are purely inerrant, right? So, um, what we have here then, uh, maybe the uh, uh, Greek Old Testament has the original and is reading the vowels rightly and, and, and not the Hebrew. Um, now, let me give you an example of where that definitely occurs. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1 with me. We'll see an example where the Greek Old Testament clearly preserves uh, the original reading and not the Hebrew. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. And he's been talking about the Son coming into the world. Verse 5, Today I've begotten you. I'll be a father to him. He'll be a son to me. Verse 6. When, and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says... And let all the angels of God worship Him. That's Deuteronomy 32, 43. And um, let's, uh, let's get... Can someone read that for us? Deuteronomy 32 and verse 43. Who can read that? Go back to Deuteronomy in, in the English. Okay. Rejoice with Him, O heavens. Bow down to Him. Well, Hebrews says that included in that verse is let all the angels of God worship him. Did you skip that? I don't think you did because that represents the Hebrew text. Hebrews is quoting the Greek Old Testament. In fact, in my margin, my New American Standard, it has Deuteronomy 32.43, sept, which means septuagint, which is from Latin for uh, 70, which is the traditional number of translators, uh, though that's, that's probably not right. Um, and in the, the Nessel Alan, let's see what they have in the margin of chapter 1 and verse 6. They have Deuteronomy 32.43, and then you see that little uh, Gothic... Uh, it's either Gothic S or G. I can't make it out, but it means Greek Old Testament. Okay? Maybe G, which means Greek. Um, so, it's found in the Greek. Now, okay. Some will say, well, okay. It's very clear. Almost all of the citations and allusions in Hebrews are from the Greek Old Testament. So, big deal. Um, they, they were too dependent on the Greek Old Testament, some might say. Some do say. However, we talked about the Qumran scrolls, right? The Qumran community. And one of the most amazing things that I'll show you this evening is you can put almost the whole Bible together from Qumran. They had copies of most of the Bible. And I'll show you that tonight. Be sure to bring your bibliography. And guess what? When they found the Qumran scrolls and they began to go through them, they found significant sections of Deuteronomy. And guess what they found in the Hebrew? This verse. This, this part of the verse. So it was in the Hebrew, which, which clearly shows the LXX preserves the, the reading, the original. Somehow the Masoretic text, the Hebrew, was corrupted. And so um, that can happen. And so that, might, that may be the answer here. Um, so contextually then in Psalm 2, because it's the context of King, so like how, how would we go... So you would read Psalm 2, you will shepherd them with a rod of iron? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm not finished. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, that, 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 you may think I'm not answering your question, but I'm gonna, I will answer it. All right. 
<laughs> so that's one option. That's one option. That may be the case. Okay. Another option is that John is using the Masoretic text, ironically, in line with the ironic use of it by the Septuagint, so that the shepherd who smites the enemy, who's trying to get the flock with, with a rod, at the same time protects them. He shepherds them. That's possible. Okay? That's, John's really involved in irony all over the place. Okay? All over the place in the book of Revelation and, and in, in, in his gospel. Um, I think that the, the best solution is this. If you turn to the full verse of Revelation 19.15, turn there with me, Revelation 19.15, then we'll break after this. Jesus is appearing, and it says, The armies in heaven follow him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, pure, and from of his mouth proceeds a sharp sword in order that with it pataxeta ethne. He should strike the nations and he himself will shepherd them with a rod of iron. And he tramples the winepress of the wine of the wrath of the anger of God, the Almighty. Well, here shepherding is not saying, oh, I'm protecting you. It's in parallelism with smiting. Shepherding is judgment here. Okay, And in fact, in the Greek Old Testament, you find that ra'ah, or poimano, uh, is used with a judgmental nuance. Okay, If you, if you want to go to some of those texts, Micah 5.5 5 or 5.6, depending on the, trans, uh, the edition you're looking at, MT or, or English, Jeremiah 6.3, Jeremiah 22.3, 22, I'll give you an example of Jeremiah 22, 22 here. Um, here's Jeremiah 22, 22. Put that up quickly. Let's try it. I have to read it to you. Here's Jeremiah 22, 22 in the Greek Old Testament. A wind shall shepherd all your shepherds. In other words, the shepherds are Israel's shepherds. But a foreign wind will come and shepherd them, and your lovers will go out in captivity because then you will be ashamed in disgrace. So uh, God will bring a foreign army, a wind that shall Shepherd, O Israel, your shepherds. So that, that, that's Jeremiah 22, 22. And um, I hate technology. So um, I think together with that and together with the fact we have a parallelism uh, of smite with shepherd and trample in the wine press in Revelation 19, 15 and 16, that likely this is just an image of judgment and what's John doing? Uh, he is using a synonym of judgment for smite. Um, and, and the LXX did the same thing. So um, either uh, that's the solution or the uh, LXX maintaining the original reading is the solution. I lean a little bit more towards that John is using a synonymous image of judgment. What, but, but what is a little problematic with that is, why are the words so similar? Now, it may be that this triggered the LXX and John to think of shepherding as an image, a synonymous image. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but sometimes you'll find that the LXX will do this uh, and misinterpret based on just vowel pointing. Have they done that here? Not necessarily. So either one of those is right. So if you get back to the text and read it, yeah, shepherd would, would, would be 
an image of judgment there in Psalm 2. It wouldn't change the meaning that much. Okay, we're about seven minutes after, so we better stop. We'll go uh, have some lunch. But I'm wanting to, we're moving a little slowly, I hate to say, because I want to be sure that I'm fleshing everything out for you. So... Just for you. I, I don't want you to pass it around. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just as long as you keep it to yourself. Hey, we were, we had a problem. I can't even find the Craig room anymore on here. And yeah, it's kind of it's pretty irritating, but it's not your fault. It's the, it's the uh, demon in the machine. So if you go up. Where does it say Craig? Here. Oh, there. I was trying to do it right here. Yeah. This is the admin. This is the Wi-Fi. What, what, where do you go? This is the display. Okay. Try to do Craig room and let me Craig see room. if that works. And then you click there. Apple. There you go. Okay. Okay. So the little display icon here. It's display. It's display. Yeah, it's display. Display. So it's the demon in me. Sorry. Okay. You guys are going to break right now? Yeah. Yeah. How long break? Hour. Hour. We will be coming back at, we'll come back here, but everybody will come back at five after two. Five after two? Yeah. Can I check your mic real quick? Yeah. I bet they're running out. No, they should be running out. <laughs> oh, I think they're pretty fine. Um, we finished with the textual use. There's one other use that we could categorize as textual, and I would like you to uh, turn to Revelation, please, chapter 1, verse uh, 4. Revelation 1, 4. It's uh, so unique that I wanted to mention this to you. Sometimes I forget. Revelation 1 and verse 4. not focused very well. Okay. Here's the very introduction here. And he says in verse 4, John to the seven churches uh, which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from Ha'on Kai Ha'en Kai Ha'erkamenos. From the one who is, and who was, and is coming. Um, there's a Greek grammatical problem with this phrase, apahaon. Uh, I'll give you a hint. There is, that means that there's an insertion. And uh, if you look down in the text, I'll pull it down. The insertion, you see the insertion mark? It's the U from God, who is and who was and is coming. And he gives a number of manuscripts. The Gothic M represents the majority of manuscripts upon which the King James is dependent, and so the King James would have that, and some fathers. The text without the of God is supported by a papyrus very early, Aleph A, uh, and those are like textual white horses riding in to save the day. Those are some of the best manuscripts that we have. Um, and so this is 
likely uh, the original reading would lack the uh, the fe'u here. Okay. Um, Oh, well, it's up here. Right here. Um, supported by better manuscripts. And we're going to see it's a more difficult reading. A, a scribe would just, uh, it would be like uh, someone who loves French toast in the morning just uh, salivating to get it. The scribe was salivating to change this because there's a problem up here. Anybody know what the problem is? Apaha'on. Why would the scribe add the genitive God after it? Anybody know? No, no, that's not so much it. Um, basically, there's just a, a rule. Our grammatical father said that after the preposition af all, you always have a genitive. You've got to have a genitive, okay? And, um, and the scribe added it. He said, that couldn't be the original inerrant because John couldn't have made a mistake because all the scribes had a high view of Scripture. So he ah. This would be a grammatical mistake. I'm going to correct it. That this is the way it must have been. And by doing so, he introduces an error into the text. Wow. Very interesting. So, uh, from the one who is, who was, and is coming. And so, we have to look at that. Uh, and let's look over here and see if we can find a solution. Well, number of references here. But if you look at Exodus 3.14 and Isaiah 41.4 in the Septuagint, you find... Uh, that um, this is an illusion, okay? Not to the Hebrew, but as they say here, to the Septuagint in both cases. And so um, let's look at that. Um, I'll show that to you in the Greek Old Testament. Okay, 314, switch back. <sighs> I think I can solve it this time. I'm amazing, aren't I? <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. Now notice, remember when God says uh, to Moses, uh, he's about to send me. He's, I'm going to send you. He said, well, whom shall I say is sending me? Here's the Greek, Hebrew, and the English of the Hebrew. Um, I, actually, this is the English translation of the Greek Old Testament. He says, and, uh, and God said to Moses, I am Ha'on. And he said, in this manner you will say to the sons of Israel, Ha'on has sent me to you. Now, in the Hebrew, um, it has, uh, Ha'on is a translation of um, and God said to Moses, Echya, Asher, Echya. I am who I am. And that's what Ha'on translates. It, it abbreviates it. It abbreviates I am who I am with Ha'on. And then uh, when it says, and uh, he said, thus uh, you will say to the sons of Israel, Echya sent me to you. So I am sent me to you. And that, that is translated as Ha'on. So it's, it's uh, um, somewhat of a unique translation. It's feasible that that could be the translation of it. But, but really... Uh, here you have uh, the verbs to be twice. I am who I am. You only get it once here and then repeated. I think John is alluding here uh, to the uh, Greek Old Testament and not the uh, Hebrew Old Testament. And so what he's doing is 
This is, this is actually called a solecism. Now, all a solecism is is a, a grammatical awkwardness that's so bad, it's virtually an error, okay? And so this is called, John is known for solecisms. Uh, my supervisor at Cambridge uh, says that uh, in the book of Revelation, you'll find some of these, and, and they're septuagint, septuagintal howlers. Just make, it would make someone who knows grammar just laugh at John. So, well, he must have made a B on his Greek test. <laughs> and it's evident here, uh, if, if Revelation had been graded. So, um, so what I think is going on, I'm, I've traced this, and um, uh, throughout my Revelation commentary, I've summarized it in an article as well. And uh, whenever you find these grammatical awkwardnesses, and here we have it first shot out of the bag in verse 4, and I think it's going to set the trend. Whenever you find it, it's always an Old Testament illusion when there's a grammatical awkwardness. Well, that's just an observation. That didn't solve anything. But as my wife says, well, okay, so what difference does that observation make? Well, I think here, in each of the cases that we find these, in this case, it perfectly accords with what the Septuagint has. It's in exactly the same uh, grammatical form, ha-on. It doesn't decline it in any other way. And I think to John, one of the ways John wants readers to recognize an illusion is to halt them a little bit. This is awkward. It, it, it's like uh, scratching your grammatical fingers on a syntactical chalkboard, and uh, it, it causes them to stop. And it's, it's a way of drawing attention to the illusion, to keep it in the very same exact verbal expression as it was. It just plops it over, doesn't conform the syntax to make it clear he's alluding. And he does this throughout the book of Revelation. I could teach a class just on solecisms. I mean, it's amazing. Well, maybe half a class. But um, so, uh, so what, what's going on here then is he doesn't. The scribe actually makes it unclearer, perhaps, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's not as awkward. And so uh, what's interesting also here is that he states you would expect this first, wouldn't you? You expect this to be in the order of who was and who is and who is coming. And uh, why does he change the order? Well, I think there's a reason for that because he keeps the order later in Revelation chapter 4 and later in chapter 11. Remember in chapter 4, that's the perspective of the heavenly throne. Here they're in the midst of the waves and he wants them to know uh, he's with them now. He is with them now. And to assure them that he's with them now, I've always been with God's people through their trials and who was. And I'll be with them in the future. And I think that's the idea. But there is actually another illusion, Isaiah 41.4. Let's look at that. And again, this is going to be from the Greek Old Testament. Isaiah 41.4. Okay, 41 fourths is part of a restoration prophecy. And um, go back. All right. This is part of a restoration prophecy. And God says, I am the one who worked and made all things. Um, the one calling... Her, that is Israel, he called from the generations of the beginning. I am, uh, I am God first and supplied. I am God unto the coming things. Then I am. So you get three references here. I am uh, I'm the first. I'll be in the future. And I am presently. It's a threefold use, and probably this is uh, developing uh, Exodus 3:14, because really the restoration that's promised here is based. It's called the second Exodus, based on the first Exodus. 
And so probably the threefold nature of this, uh, it doesn't come from Exodus 3.14, but it comes from a passage that alludes to it. And uh, so here we have a combination, really, of two, two allusions, and there's a reason that, that, that it's changed from uh, um, the... Uh, that the, that the ha own is put first instead of the the ha aim. So this is a textual use, kind of like an expansion idea. Yeah, it's just another time he he alludes the Septuagint to really make it clear what passage he's referring to. Yeah. Okay. This happens all over the Book of Revelation. Okay. Um, now the next use is the assimilated use. It's pretty easy to understand. It's very much like the stock and trade use, and so maybe a, a subcategory of analogy. The assimilated use is, um, you know, I actually have my list now. So I think we're on number 11. This use is where Old Testament language has become merely part of the author's vocabulary. Remember I was talking about the Puritans and um, early Judaism um, and how it just became, it was the language in which they spoke and became their everyday language. Um, and, and so sometimes they may, be, they may make an expression that sounds like... Um, they're alluding to a text, but it's just part of their vocabulary, all right? Let me give you some examples of that. Matthew 6.13. And Matthew 6.13, uh, that's the Lord's Prayer, conclusion of it. And um, there, and, and this is only in the King James, which is based on the majority text. It says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And um, it could be an allusion to Psalm 144.11. They'll speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. Daniel 2.37 is similar. Um, but there are passages which speak of kingdom, power, glory elsewhere. So probably, since there are so many, uh, this could be just stock and trade or it just could be the assimilated use of the Old Testament. Now, again, we come... Uh, 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 th th this may have been uh, the scribe who assimilated it if he added this, if the King James isn't, isn't right. Um, another example would be Revelation 5.12. Uh, that text says, uh, let me put it up. And they were saying in a great voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power and the riches and the wisdom and the power and the honor and the glory and the blessing. Sounds like the Messiah, which it is. Um, and uh, that language, that, that, that collection of, of, of language, power, riches, wisdom, might, and honor um, is, is found in Daniel 2.20, Daniel 4.30, 4.37. Um, and, and so on. So this may be stock and trade, or it could express, sometimes stock and trade might merely express, wow, th this is just what the author is um, saying. This is praise language, and this is just the coinage. It's, it's already been coined, and it's not alluding to any particular text. It's really hard to know, and it's really hard to distinguish this from a stock and trade. So nevertheless, there probably is a distinction, but it's sometimes hard to make that distinction. Um, and again, if, if this is John's wording, then he's giving an interpretative paraphrase of what he heard. It's hard to know sometimes, is he recording exactly, or is he giving an interpretative paraphrase? Either, either way, it's going to be true to the vision, just as the interpretative paraphrases, say, of uh, uh, Mark, of Matthew, if he does such a thing, are uh, 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 going to be true to what Jesus said. So we don't have to give what's called the ipsissima verba, 
in the Gospels. It doesn't give the exact words. We can give the system of ox, the interpretative voice, which is true to what was said. I and mean, newspapers do that all the time. So um, if they can do it, why can't Jesus and his apostles? So, um, okay, a third of the last use here is the ironic uh, or the inverted use of the Old Testament. Now, irony is the saying of one thing and meaning its opposite. So, for example, if, uh, you know, we have a tennis court down there and I went down to play tennis and the faculty were around and students and some of the faculty said, Bill, you're a great tennis player. Everyone, and, and, and they said that after about five minutes of watching me play tennis, everyone would laugh because they would know that this faculty member was really meaning the opposite. I'm a bad tennis player. I either hit it in the net or over the backstop. And uh, so um, that, 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 that's irony, saying one thing meaning it's opposite for a variety of purposes, whether to ridicule or to mock or uh, some other purpose. Um, so, and actually, uh, uh, this becomes really a, a biblical theology. I have a manuscript I've never published. I don't know if I ever will. I wrote it way back in the mid-'80s. It was called The Ironic Patterns of Biblical Theology. And, and in it, I, I observed two kinds of ironies, restorative irony, whereby the faithful suffer and appear defeated, but are vindicated either in this life or the next, and retributive irony, whereby the ungodly appear victorious in this life and appear to win, when in reality, sometimes they either end up losing in this life or it's until the next life that they lose. Retributive irony, yeah. Those categories were first introduced to me by a friend by the name of Warren Gage, who wrote a good little book for, with Eisenbronn's called the, the Gospel of Genesis, which is the first part of that book is, uh, I think, a good book. Um, and I, I had written on irony, but um, hadn't quite put it in those two categories. I, I like them. So what are some examples? Well, let's look at Romans uh, 5.14. That would be a good example. Romans 5.14. Romans 5.14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of Adam's offense, who is a type of him who was to come, a tupos of him who was to come. Um, my new American standard here even has, in place of type, a foreshadowing. Very interesting. They're, they're interpreting that, I think, in a good way. Um, so... Well, what's, why, is, why is that uh, ironic or antithetical, um, uh, an antithetical use? Well, the first Adam committed an act of disobedience leading to condemnation. It's being compared with the last Adam who performed an act of obedience leading to non-condemnation, to justification. But it's a type. How in the world could the first Adam doing such opposite things be a foreshadowing of uh, Jesus Christ, the last Adam? Well, because he is a type. It is a mirror image of um, what's going to happen in an opposite way. In fact, we're going to find uh, later today in our class that one aspect of typology is that when kings and priests uh, and prophets are given commissions by God and when they don't fulfill them, that lack of fulfillment cries out for someone to fulfill. That lack of fulfillment is a blank space and it can't be left in the redemptive historical program of God. And it cries out. We'll see how it cries out. But it cries out for fulfillment. And that would be the case here. The opposite cry... The, the disobedience and condemnation cries out, if you will. It foreshadows. It looks forward to the opposite good act and good result. So that would be antithetical typology at that point. And another text, if you turn to Galatians 3. Galatians 3. 
Galatians 3, verse 13. Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So, um, here, this text, Curses everyone who hangs on a tree, is a quotation from Deuteronomy 21, 23. And there it refers to the person who's committed the most heinous crime, the worst crime in, in, uh, in Israel, and they must be executed and then hung on a tree for a period of time. So the punishment for the worst person in Israel becomes the punishment for the best person in Israel. In fact, this is why Paul at first couldn't accept Jesus as Messiah, because of this. Even in Qumran, they understood crucifixion to be the fulfillment of, of this Deuteronomy text. So it was contemporary. And Paul just said, you, that, that, you, you're blaspheming the Messiah. That's why he persecuted Christians. He was so angry. And then, of course, he has his own ironic reversal. Um, and so um, this is either an ironic typology or an ironic analogy, one or the other. And we'd have to do more work to see which that is. Um, maybe another one, broadly speaking, is uh, the diversity of tongues that ca God caused at Babel. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go into it, but at Pentecost, there's an allusion to the same people groups that were at Babel. But now these are tongues for blessing, not tongues for cursing. So there may be a kind of uh, antithetical analogy or typology between Babel and Pentecost. Um, I've, uh, I've, <laughs> I've argued that in my book, the, the Temple and the Church's Mission, in the section on, on Acts, where I, I argue that the tongues of fire descending is the descent of the heavenly temple of God because tongues of fire in Isaiah 5 and in early Jewish literature always refers to God's theophonic presence in his temple. So actually God's descending and building his people into his temple, and that's the first place where we really get God's people being built into the temple. So it's an exciting Exciting. Uh, that, uh, that, that, that's a charismatic uh, interpretation. <laughs> um, all right. Um, well, let me summarize a few things then. In all of these uses, except the rhetorical use, which uh, the embellishment use, all of these uh, assume the crucial role of the broad Old Testament context. To, to really understand them, you've got to understand the Old Testament context. And and this is really the contribution of C.H. Dodd in the little book that I've been telling you about. Here it is here. Um, if you, I, I can't remember if this is, if somebody, could somebody find out if this is actually online or do they just have multiple copies in the I, library? I found one that was uh, a PDF for when I sent it to these guys. Did you? Yeah, I just uh, did a Google search and I actually found it and it was a false, uh, looked like it was a copy. It's the actual page of book. I love it. Yeah. Good for you. Would you send it to me? Yeah. Thank you. Sure will. Thank you. That is amazing because it's pretty expensive now. Where'd you get that? Um, How much? <laughs> Did you pay forty dollars? Oh no. What? What'd you pay? Oh, I think I paid sixty-five. Well, you got the actual book. That's yeah. good. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you got the book, man. It's great. I love it. <laughs> that book is hard to find. Yeah. It is, and uh, so in a, uh, class I taught a couple of years ago, guys just scoured the internet and, and found places to buy them that were reasonable, like twenty, thirty dollars. But yeah, okay. Um, now Dodd in that little book. I wish I could write a little book that had such an impact like that. I just can't write little books. I don't know what it is. I, it's a real problem. I mean, you know, I'm, I somehow result in that kind of thing, you know. But they serve as good doorstops. So, and, and, you know, if you really did this with each hand, you get some exercise too. Um, what he asserted was that when the Old Testament is quoted or even briefly alluded to uh, in the New Testament, 
that actually those are just tips of the iceberg of the broader Old, Co Old Testament context of the passages alluded to or quoted. And he makes uh, the argument for that in that little book. They're just tips of the iceberg. And it, 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 the, these are signposts. Go back to the broad context. That's the idea that he argued for. For example, and I'll just put this. These are my 1984 notes here. Let's see here. Show you my wonderful handwriting. You know, in fourth grade, I got a, a prize in handwriting, and Mrs. Perry gave me a little eraser I could put over my pencil. And uh, at any rate, um, notice here. Some of this is this is almost like uh, it's text critical. Uh, this this represents uh, 2008. Some of this, this represents 2003, I think. I, I can't uh, think of all of it. Uh, this is like, uh, so I have, uh, the dates are updated. Uh, I mean, the, the, the comments are added. You know, it keeps uh, getting bigger and bigger, so it's a midrash on my own notes. Um, but here, basically Dodd lists uh, what he calls testimonia. What he's reacting against, by the way, is there was an earlier argument in the 20s that there was a there was a testimony book, a proof text. I call it the navigator card book. You know, navigator cards, if you want to go to, um, you know, suffering, you go to the card that says suffering, and you're trying to memorize it. They're all in alphabetical order, and they're all right there. They don't have the context, okay? And so these lists of proof texts were, were made by early Christians, and they didn't have the context. And so... Uh, uh, Rendell Harris, who came up with this theory, uh, I think he called it the testimony book hypothesis, uh, said that all of these verses that are similar, that are the same here, and we'll see that a lot of these are repeatedly used by New Testament writers, that came from a testimony book, and that's why you have such a repetition. And, um, but Dodd found problems with that. How did he find problems with it? Because even when... And, of course, by the way, Harris's theory meant there was a non-contextual use of the Old Testament because they're quoting from a list that has no context, okay? Just to insert that. When Dodd looks at these verses, he, he observes that the New Testament authors quote or allude not exactly only to the same verse, but different parts of the verse, well, that would be unusual. If you've got a testimony book, you can quote the whole thing, right? And uh, so they allude to parts of the same, quote, or allude parts of the same verse or even parts of the same from the context. And the, these are the ones that are repeated by the New Testament writers, Psalm 2, 7, 8, 110, 118, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 53, 40, 28, Genesis 12, 3, 22, Jeremiah 31, Joel 2, Zechariah 9, Habakkuk 2, Isaiah 61, Deuteronomy 28. And uh, those, are, those are verses that are different parts of verses or different parts of a verse are quoted from those. But furthermore, it wasn't just the same verse. As I said here, sometimes they quote from uh, the same segments of the Old Testament. So, for example, they'll quote from Deuteronomy 28 to 32. Okay. They'll quote from Isaiah 40 to 66, as Matt Harmon argued in his dissertation that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, the Gospel of Isaiah in um, Galatians. Daniel 7 through 12, as we saw with uh, the Synoptic Eschatological Discourse, Genesis 12 to 22, Genesis 1 to 3, etc. So sometimes they'll quote, a, they'll quote different verses, but from the same contexts. And so Dodd said, what does that reveal? Why are they quoting some of the same verses sometimes at different parts and, and from the very same contexts, even if they're not from the very same verses? And he said that all of this points to an awareness of context, not merely an awareness of single verses. And he asked, why do New Testament authors quote different verses from the same context? Well, he said, you know, could this be an early ecclesiological committee that told them what context were best? I don't know about you, if you're on any committees, but, I, but schools have committees out the year. I've really never known a committee to be very creative and to do much. I'm sure there are exceptions, but at any rate, 
sometimes the results of committees or conclusions, they don't, they either don't end up getting carried out, or uh, if they get carried out, they're carried out for a while, and then things are reversed. But Dodd concluded the best candidate for who guided the apostles to these contexts was Jesus. And I agree with him. Uh, single verses are merely signposts to the overall context of the Old Testament from which they are quoted. So um, that is a, it's a very hugely important work, and I'll talk a little bit more about it here pretty soon. Um, and one of the biggest arguments most recently against the contextual use of the old and the new is um, by a, a fellow by the name of Christopher Stanley. And he actually argues that a lot, I think he thinks most, of Paul's uses of the Old Testament are um, embellishment uses. But he, he says it's, it's more than that. It's, it's rhetorical. Okay, he, he uses that word, I understand, in a different way in your steps. But he says Paul was doing a power play. We get a little postmodernism here. He was doing a power play, and to appeal to the authority of Scripture would mute anybody uh, who uh, might try to disagree with him who also respected Scripture. Well, that's my view. Right. So, he would just say my view is wrong. Right. Okay. Now, actually, I, I, I do believe that Paul, every use of his, is probably rhetorical. So I, I agree with Stanley in that regard. But he thinks Paul is trying them, is trying to move them to his position in, in kind of a, a really a power play. Okay? And Paul is trying to move them by God's Word and by the Spirit working. That's what he's trying to do. That's a whole different thing. If we want to call that a divine power play, I'm fine with it. <laughs> All right? That's fine. But, but um, I think Paul... So every, Paul's always trying to move them, okay? But you have to be careful. How? Is it, you know, in postmodernism, it's sort of like, you know, the people in power uh, have their own rhetoric to suppress the masses or... Um, so forth and so on. And um, so, um, all right. Um, now, now we're going to go to a very important section. Uh, we're going to go to the presuppositions of the uh, apostles, the presuppositions of the apostles. I have a handout here. This, in fact, I have a number of handouts. I have two. For you, if we could just pass that all the way around, please. And then I have a second handout. Keep them both for you. All of this is on the online course, but just for convenience and facilitation, I'm, I'm handing this material out to you. So we're going to start with, with this, okay, have that before you, but we'll also be looking at the other handout as well, and we'll be going uh, back and back and forth. Yes, yes it is. It won't take long for you to find it, but for now, this is why I have the handout, so we don't have to take time to find it and so forth. So, but it's all there. All right. So, this lecture's title, this is a new lecture, Summary of the Presuppositions of the Apostles' Exegetical Method. Here's the outline of the lecture. That's the bone structure. We're going to look at challenges to the contextual use of the old and the new. We're again going to look briefly at C.H. Dodd and his significance. Then we're going to look at the presuppositions themselves, 
And then we're going to look at what I call the normative versus descriptive debate. And here what we're concerned about is should we imitate the apostles' exegetical method or not? Okay? Descriptive means, well, uh, you know, we can describe what Paul is doing, but let's not imitate it. Okay? But normative would be it's normative for us. It's a huge, huge debate even within evangelicalism. Okay. Um, so let's start out. First of all, challenges to the contextual use of the Old Testament in the New. And um, and the, the issue of non-contextual um, exegesis in the New Testament is tied usually in, in, in discussion by scholars to their relationship to Jewish exegesis of the time. There's an assumption, even by evangelical scholars, but by many scholars, that the Jews of Jesus and Paul's time were wild and crazy exegetes. They weren't good. They, they just grabbed for all the hermeneutical gusto they could and didn't pay much attention to the Old Testament. It's a general view. And, um, and so some say, well, look, everybody, have you heard this phrase? Uh, everybody is a socially constructed creature. Socially constructed. What does that mean? Our makeup is a result of growing up in a, cult, a family, a culture. That's who we are. It, for, it, 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 it shapes how we think. And, of course, that's, that's very true. All right. And so the apostles are part of that culture. The first, they're, they're, they're Jewish exegetes, right? They're Christian Jewish exegetes. And so um, they're part of the hermeneutical environment. They're, they're, they're culturally uh, uh, conditioned uh, hermeneutical creatures. They can't help but interpret the way they, they grew up learning how to interpret in that Jewish background in that Jewish culture. So that's, that's the argument of uh, many scholars, including Longenecker. This is some, some evangelical scholars hold this as well. Peter Enns holds this. He used to teach here in Old Testament. He used to teach this course quite differently than I do. But um, uh, he, in fact, he used to call this course Jewish backgrounds to the New Testament because he saw it so linked to Jewish interpretation. And uh, when I came, I changed it to New Testament use of the Old. And, um, but that doesn't mean I don't, I, I don't believe uh, that there's a lot of help from Jewish backgrounds. That's what we're going to do tonight in our library tour. But um, that's definitely a, the postmodern way of teaching. Well, it, you, you, you fit, the social construction comes from postmodernism, right. okay? Right. And so um, th th this fits in beautifully. Scholars held this before, but then postmodernism provided them even more ammo, okay? And by the way, what, what's the problem with that? What would you say is the problem with that? I mean, it makes amazing sense. Well, then how would you know what the truth is in, in, in the end? Because you hit the nail, hit the nail on the head, hit the nail on the head. Because in postmodernism, everybody has a lens. It's their presupposition, and they read, read it in, and um, if you're... Exactly. Right, you might, because what's true for you is exactly. not the same truth for me. Exactly. And the reason is we all have different presuppositions. And we just need to respect one another. That's well, the new tolerance. <laughs> the new tolerance. Yeah. Tyler would say that he would say that's the reason for God. He would say that's the socially constructed person. And the only reason you think that social construction is the way to go is because you were brought up in a socially constructed milieu yourself. <laughs> that's, so now, is that clear? Somewhat, yeah. I mean, I think it's true. I think we are. But what it doesn't leave room for when Christians adapt this, who try to adapt it to this argument, doesn't leave room for what? What would you say? The piercing revelation of God that can pierce through our socially constructed condition. All of us ultimately are socially constructed by the first Adam, right? Ultimately, and we're, we're around people who are part of his fallen. So God's got to come in. 
and he breaks through that social construction. If we don't believe that, then let's just leave the class today. Well, you know. I just used to think about it where Pilate got, he was just so, he had truth standing in front of him, and his only response was, what is it? It's amazing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, that helps a lot to understand why some scholars, though, think that, look, you, you've got to take into account that at least some of Judaism affected the New Testament, and they interpreted at, at least some of the time in a wild and crazy way. But then that doesn't take into consideration the revelation of God, which produced an inerrant text. Of course, what that means is those who are arguing against that, well, they don't believe in an inerrant, an inerrant text either. And uh, so... <clears throat> um, and some would say, well, while we today would regard those methods by the New Testament writers in Judaism as illegitimate, who are we to judge them? Again, this is a postmodern evaluation. They, they, for their time, it was right. You know, let's not impose our standards on them. You know, it sounds so judgmental for us to do that. And... Um, and so, Yeah. Oh, sure. You, you poor people. Right. You just haven't been enlightened. Exactly. Exactly. It's a, it's considered fundamentalism. Yes. So you know, which which um, years ago fundamentalism had to do with a lifestyle of legalism and separation, right. Right. but now it's begun to encompass more. It's begun to encompass inerrancy and so on. So mm. it's it's very tied in with things you wouldn't. Yeah. You wouldn't associate yourself with. Yeah. But because of. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, still under this uh, topic of challenges here, my, my response to this, a starting point, is that, well, wait a minute, you're assuming that all of Judaism was wild and crazy, and they are. But, in fact, uh, there, there's a scholar, his name is Enstone Brewer, and uh, he produced a book. Um, that talked about rabbinic exegesis prior to 70 A.D. And what he found is he actually went to the literature of the rabbis and found all of the rabbinic exegeses of the Old Testament that he could predate to 70 A.D. Now, some of it was tough to date. There's debates about some of it. but he, So he studied those uses of the Old Testament by uh, pre-70 A.D. A.D. Jewish rabbis. And what he found was all of them tried to interpret the Old Testament straightforwardly or literally or to develop its original meaning. Now, sometimes they failed, but you could tell they were still trying. And, and that it was later Judaism, in his view, that became more wild, more allegorical and atomistic and interpreting out of context. So that's a very important... Now, not all have received his book uh, uh, well, but some have. I think he's done a good job in, um, in arguing for that. And um, uh, I'll give you the name of his book here. Well, actually, that's what... Uh, he's produced another book. That's the tradition of the, rab of, of the rabbis. Um, his, his book... Is uh, yeah. the hermeneutical method of early Judaism and Paul. Now, that's the name of the dissertation in 1989. I'm, that's it. So he changed it. He changed it. What is it? Techniques? Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Thanks. So I've got a different title because this is a dissertation. It hadn't been published at that point. So, uh, so that was that's very interesting. Um, there may have been a difference, you know, as time went on, where there was more of a non-contextual emphasis after 70 A.D. Part of the reason, perhaps, could have been they don't have a temple anymore, so then they have to allegorize that now their prayer is the offering of the temple. And now this and that, okay? Uh, reading the scripture is like an offering in the temple and, and so on. 
So, you know, begin to allegorize. And perhaps that, that, that could have been the root of it. I'm not sure. But um, I had a student at, at Wheaton um, who was doing a dissertation. And one of the requirements we had at Wheaton for a doctoral program is that they had to take a course at another university, uh, preferably a non-evangelical school, just so they can get into the real world and see, you know, what they're going to face. And so uh, Mitch Kim is my student. He did that. He went to the University of Chicago, took a course on a, uh, a sector of Midrashim in later Judaism, way after 70 A.D., taught by a rabbi, and it was amazing. The rabbi said, this section, this section of, of Midrash that we're going to be studying now uses the Old Testament very contextually. So even later Midrashim are not necessarily wild and crazy. And so be careful when people make these sweeping generalizations like, well, in Judaism, they were just kind of wild and they were just sort of crazy. And um, so, uh, in fact, what, what, what you have, let me... Let's go to the board here. In, in, in the first century, you, you have different pockets of Judaism. We could call it different Judaisms existing at the same time. you got the Dead Sea Scrolls here. You have Palestinian Judaism. Here, which, which we will say rabbinic, early rabbinic. Here. You got Alexandrian Judaism in Egypt. Philo would be an example of that, first century uh, writer who combines Greek philosophy with exegesis of the Old Testament. We'll talk more about him. Uh, but known for uh, uh, allegorical exegesis. And um, you've got uh, apocalyptic Judaism. We don't know a lot about the origins of apocalyptic Judaism, whether we could call this an actual community. Probably not. We're just not sure. Some of it shows up in Qumran, but uh, nevertheless we could probably still categorize, categorize this separately as apocalyptic Judaism, and we do find some of it in Qumran. And then we have New Testament Judaism, okay? Jewish Christian movement. Now, there are some who believe, both evangelical and non-evangelical scholars, that um, when the New Testament interpreted the Old, they were dependent on the way other Jews interpreted the Scriptures. What's interesting about that is that usually they don't say Palestinian Judaism was dependent on Dead Sea Scrolls or that Alexandrian Judaism was dependent on the Dead Sea or on Palestinian Judaism. It's mainly the New Testament that, that, that are the mindless absorbers of other people's exegesis. But in reality, each of these groups uh, have their own, that's, as we talked about, the Dead Sea Scrolls have their own presuppositions. So did Palestinian Judaism. It certainly weren't the Dead Sea Scrolls presuppositions. Alexandrian uh, tended to be allegorical. Uh, apocalyptic Judaism, how would we categorize that? Well, it's visionary literature, certainly. Um, and, and then the New Testament. Probably all of these should be seen as separate but somewhat related groups, certainly. And sometimes we do find, in fact, that as in Stone Brewer and as my doctoral student found out, that a lot of this is very similar. A lot of it is good contextual exegesis. Now, Philo... He'll often interpret literally or straightforwardly. He's good. And then he'll go to the allegorical, what he thinks is the deeper meaning. Um, 
I don't see that in the New Testament. You hear people saying that, well, allegories in the New Testament. Paul talks about allegoreo, uh, the, the allegory of uh, uh, Sarah and Hagar, but um, allegory did not have that meaning back then, that word. Um, probably that's a typology that uh, um, Hagar was a type of the unbelieving Jews Paul was confronting, and Sarah was a type of uh, the Christian community. So, um, so, so one has to be careful. Uh, yeah, there's a similarity, but it's all, probably all because these people were going back to the same source and imitating the Old Testament's use of the Old Testament, which I think was a good hermeneutical method in interpreting uh, straightforwardly, trying to develop earlier meanings, as well as using typology. So, um, so you have to be careful. Half of my uh, dissertation and, and, and subsequent book, uh, The Use of Daniel in Jewish Apocalyptic Literature and the Revelation of, of John, was on showing that here, and in some places in the Dead Sea Scrolls, these two areas here, that they were very contextual. I mean, we already saw the, first, the war scroll, didn't we? That was pretty contextual, wasn't it? It's was amazing. And there are other places in, 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 in Judaism where that's the case. And then I lay all that out in my book. So the, there, there's an amazing awareness of uh, context. So all I'm saying is uh, beware of sweeping generalizations. We have to admit, yeah, th th there were some uh, wild interpretations um, in all these areas. That's right. Exactly. But they were good. And I think there was a lot of good stuff, and uh, including in, 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 in Qumran. Uh, for example, in the Habakkuk scroll, he'll take passages and apply them, you know, apply what was true of the Babylonians to the Romans. And some say, well, that's ridiculous. But in fact, if that's typological in Habakkuk, and the Romans overcame Jerusalem, which they looked like they were about to do, and they were about to be exiled, then it makes sense that Qumran would see that as a type. But a lot of people don't take that approach. If I have time, and I won't in the rest of my life, if I had time, I'd like to go further into the Dead Sea Scrolls and talk about how a lot of this is not allegory but typology. And by the way, when you hear a lot of people today uh, love to appeal to the fathers because they say, well, they allegorized the text, and hey, they really set a model for the whole church, and uh, we should follow them. This is part of, actually, uh, those who like postmodernism because they give these wild interpretations, and, and, and we should respect them. In fact, we should even follow it. And um, a lot of it's typology instead of allegory, but people think typology is off the wall, so they just push the two together, okay? They push the two. How can a historical event be a prophecy? That's absurd. So... Um, Okay, um, so my book shows that, that there are significant se segments in Qumran and apocalyptic Judaism where, where there's contextual exegesis. So it, it flies in the face of this idea that they, yeah, okay, they grew up in a socially conditioned atmosphere. Yeah, it was an atmosphere of bad exegesis, but also an atmosphere of good exegesis. And I think Jesus was a good exegete, and he taught his disciples how to do it. That's the bottom line. <laughs> so... Um, at any rate. But as I said, this becomes a Christological problem if you're, if you're going to take this approach because Jesus did a lot of interpretation of the Old Testament. If you say he was out to lunch, then it, you're in bad shape, I think. Or it wasn't Jesus. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It's an easy way to take a lot of things out of Jesus. Yeah, but a lot of time they won't say that. If they can show Jesus was wrong, then they won't go that route. That's true. That's true, too. <laughs> uh, there is a book. Uh, it's by Hans Hubner. Uh, and it is uh, it's called uh, Biblische Theologie des Neuen Testaments, Biblical Theology of the New Testament, okay? And in this book, uh, he quotes and agrees with a scholar by the name of Koch. And uh, because a lot of people like to appeal to the Germans, you know, they, they seem to always be on the cutting edge in uh, biblical and theological studies, and uh, that's why they like to use German words like Heilsgeschichte and so forth and so on. And um, so what are the Germans thinking 
about this issue. Okay? Is this just kind of a conservative right-wing evangelicals who want to say the New Testament uh, interpreted the old contextually? Well, here's what he says. This is the conclusion of what he says. He's been talking. He says, what I've said above is clearly recognized. He's, he's argued that there's a contextual understanding of the New Testament by Paul. And he says, these facts are clearly recognized also in that work, which today is the standard work on Paul in the Old Testament, and which therefore has replaced Otto Meikle's book in this function. Uh, and this book is the main habilitations work. That's where Germans get two doctorates. They don't get one. So their second doctor is called a habilitation. Okay? Uh, it's the second dissertation by Dietrich Alex Koch called Scripture as a Witness to the Gospel, Investigation of the Use and Understanding of the Scriptures by Paul. You know, you can't have a short title in a German book. Uh, I remember when I went to Tübingen for a year. I was in, in Germany in a university town where I studied uh, under a fellow there during my uh, kind of in the middle of my Cambridge studies and, and and my wife and I were living with international students a lot of Germans but also students from the Netherlands uh, from from Scandinavia and a student was telling a joke and it was on the Norwegians the punchline was the Norwegians and we don't know anything about Norwegians so we just kind of you know when you don't understand a joke you kind of laugh a little bit so we didn't understand the punchline but the rest of it was funny enough to us and it was about different nationalities, uh, uh, writing a book on the elephant. So the English, what would they title their book on the elephant? Uh, how I shot my first elephant, all right? Uh, the French, what would they title it? Love Life of the Elephant. Um, Americans, how to grow elephants bigger and better. <laughs> the Germans, an introduction to the life of the elephant in six volumes. <laughs> to me, that was funny enough. And this long title kind of uh, testifies to that. But Koch, now remember he says that this is the standard work on Paul and his use of the Old Testament. Now, that probably 10 years ago or so, I can't remember the exact date, maybe 15. Uh, but here's what he says. Koch identifies or establishes divergencies between the Jewish Hellenistic and rabbinic interpretations of Scripture on the one hand, all, all of that that I'm talking about, and those of Paul on the other hand. In other words, Jewish Hellenistic rabbinic encompasses everything I put up there except for the New Testament, okay? And he, he, he looks at this, he looks at Paul, he says, they're different. They're divergencies, okay? And then he says, therefore, Koch arrives at a correct methodological principle. And he quotes Koch. One is dependent, therefore, regarding the methods of interpretation of Scripture, which for Paul are assumed. One is dependent on conclusions from his own letters. In other words, if you want to know how Paul exegetes, don't look at DSS, Palestinian Judaism, Alexandrian, Apocalyptic. Study Paul. That's how you know how he exegetes. That's what you do. First. You do that first. Then... Uh, then you can analyze independently Jewish methods of interpretation and where they're relevant, bring them into play and see how they compare with Paul. But you, you establish, yeah, just as here, exegetes who study Dead Sea Scrolls study only Dead Sea Scrolls. They don't try to study the New Testament to see how the Dead Sea Scrolls exegeted, but, but they sure do study the Dead Sea Scrolls to understand how the New Testament's exegeted. Isn't that interesting? They don't study the New Testament to see how... Uh, uh, Alexandria, Alexandrian Judaism interpreted, but they certainly study it to see how Paul interpreted it. It is weird. It's weird. I think it's because there's such a backlash against the New Testament being unique, much less inspired. There's a backlash against it. A lot of it is. I, I'm convinced of this, especially for unbelieving scholars, and there are a lot of them, uh, a lot of unbelieving biblical scholars. If it were true, then they're accountable. I think there's an implicit underlying moral mm -hmm. thing going on there. If, if, this, if this is true, I'm accountable. That's huge. You can't get that out of anybody's mind. Mm -hmm. So none of us are off the hook. We believe it's true and, you know, we stand <laughs> accused before God and thank the Lord for the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's imputed to us. Um, all right. 
So that's that's very uh, very important, and it's it's often claimed. Um, let me put this up. There, 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 are, there, are, there are a number of difficult passages that people claim are used non-contextually by the New Testament. And uh, this is uh, the second page of, your, of this handout I gave you. I'd like you to turn to that. It looks like this. It's a supplement to challenges. And uh, basically what you find is this. There are two categories of, 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 of passages that New Testament scholars think are wrongly used by New Testament writers. One are the typological passages. How can an event be seen to be fulfilled in the New? You're turning an event into prophecy? Ridiculous. Even a student in hermeneutics 101 wouldn't make that mistake. And if they did, they get graded down. Number two, um, passages which apply prophecies of Israel to an individual, i.e. Jesus. That's a misuse. How can you apply a prophecy of a nation to, to an individual? Or prophecies of Israel's uh, deliverance and restoration being applied to a predominantly Gentile church. What could be more uh, uh, wild and crazy? Or prophecies of the individual Messiah applied to the church, especially the Gentile church. I mean, how, how can you go from individual to corporate or corporate to individual? This is, this, is, uh, this is just not right exegesis. And then there's some specific passages. Uh, Longenecker talks about, um, he, he refers to ad hominem uh, argumentation here and that some passages are used in an ad hominem way. Now, ad hominem literally in Latin means against the man. All right? Now, I remember... Um, I have to be careful what I say here. This is on camera. <laughs> Remind me at dinner to talk about an ad hominem uh, argument used against me. All right? Remind me because I don't want it on camera because it will reveal too much. All right? <laughs> so, um, but, it, but it's against the man. And we see this in politics all the time. I mean, what's Trump doing? She's a liar. And what's she doing? Ah, he's ripping people off. It's, it's an argument against character and not against the actual uh, um, reasonable arguments that are being given. You don't try to tear down the argument, you tear down the person. You've seen that before, okay? And so Longenecker sees that that's what Paul is doing. He's fighting. He's so intensely zealous for the truth of God. He's fighting against these Jews who he says, yeah, they need to circumcise themselves. And, you know, they're, 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 they're the non-circumcision. And true believers are the true circumcision, he says, in Galatians uh, or Philippians uh, chapter 3. And uh, just to give you a good example of this, uh, uh, of, of him attacking the man and, and not the Jewish position, uh, Longenecker reduces 2 Corinthians 3, 13 to 18 in the veil. And, and the veil comes out of the veil over Moses' face in, in, in the book of Exodus, I think chapters 33, 34. And... And, and so Paul alludes to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And he says, um, he, he, he uses it, and he says, what does that mean, that, that veil over Moses' face? Um, and he says, verse 13, uh, Moses used to put a veil over his face that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. And so, Longenecker sees Paul saying here, you know what's wrong with you Jews who don't accept Christianity? Uh, you're just hardened. I mean, how would that work if you were working with an... Let's say you were arguing with someone from a Lutheran church, if you're not Lutheran, or from some other denomination. And you said, you know, you're just blind. Because that's what he's saying here. You know, that, that's an accusation against the character as well as their, their stance. And um, 
I have uh, uh, an article in Right Doctrine from Wrong Text by Morna Hooker who argues, indeed, that Paul misused this text from Exodus. also have a, a argument, a, a, an article by a former colleague of mine named Scott Hafeman. We used to teach together both at Gordon-Conwell and at Wheaton. And he argues, no, no, it's used very contextually. And so, by the way, in this case, I don't have a problem. Of course, this is an attack against the character. But, uh, I mean, they're, they're unbelievers. And, you know, they're not going to take it well, of course. But uh, it's a very contextual use. Uh, he's not saying anything different than what uh, uh, Moses understood in, in, at his time, that the majority of Israel was hardened, indeed, throughout their generations. And that just continued. But that might not set well with a, a Jew who is hardened, who Paul is, is, is talking to. But that, that, that's an example. Uh, Longnecker thinks it's misused to attack the character. There's a little bit of truth in it. He, of course, he's attacking character, but, but there's more to it than that. Um, they need their eyes open. Um, another example of this would be uh, midrashic treatments that are non-contextual. And what he means by midrashic here is... Uh, misusing a scripture to interpret another scripture. Remember, midrashic means interpreting one scripture by another. Well, this means trying to do that, but misusing it, not doing it rightly and distorting scripture. And um, we already looked, didn't we, at Deuteronomy 30 here in Romans 10, remember? And uh, my own conclusion, uh, which is a conclusion reached by others, very good, uh, people, Mark Seifred, for example, Elizabeth Shively, who now teaches at the University of Aberdeen, uh, no, University of St. Andrews with Scott Hafeman. Um, she's argued in a very fine paper that this is typology. The law, which is the revelation, the zenith, the revelation of God in the Old Testament, was a pointer to a much greater revelation, uh, the revelation of the Messiah. And therefore, we have a typological use. It's not uh, a wrong midrashic use. Um, another one is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. A uh, very, very difficult text. You remember it? It says um, the Israelites ate the same spiritual food in chapter 10, verse 3, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Well, there's some later Midrashic. Uh, uh, some of it is, I, I, I think it, it was trying to uh, expand interpretatively in a wrong way. And uh, they said that there was actually a, a well, a well that, that followed the Israelites, that fed them water. You just turn the spigot when you want. Now, Peter Enns actually argued that. He used to teach here. He ar actually argued that. And he, he, he said, well, Paul's inspired anyway, but um, he alludes to the legend, the Jewish legend from later Judaism. Now, if you're interested in, in how I interact with him, uh, in Themelios, I have two articles where I, I write an article in response to him, and then he writes one in response to me, and then I write one back in response to him. Uh, if, you, if, if you're interested, um, you can find that in, in Thamelios around... Um, uh, Is that the one that was on the Psalm 23? No. No, that's a different one. That's, that's something different. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the, that's the Yes, yes, I did include those in that book. I did. Those articles are included there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there are, so erosion of inerrancy and in evangelicalism, or you can look at the I, you know, you could probably put my name in, and and, and they'll 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 pop up. But but I respond to this, and basically part of the response is, look, uh, it's clear comparing texts in Exodus and Deuteronomy that um, God was identified as a rock, okay? And the Psalms, especially later, uh, interpret God as the one who fed them, who gave them water in the wilderness, all right? And it's not a magical well, you know, riding around on a golf cart somewhere and you just kind of let the golf cart come up and you get a spigot. But that's what Enns argued. And... Uh, and one of the passages he argued it from, one of the main passages, was a textual problem at, at a very crucial point. And I said, in fact, if you're familiar with the manuscripts, it's hard to get, you know, it's a whole different area, the manuscript, judging manuscripts um, in the, um, I think this, this was um, 
pseudophilo, okay? So you've got to get used to the manuscripts and pseudophilo in Latin, which is not fun. But you've got to go to the, you know, the technical work and, and read about the manuscripts and forth and so on. So a lot of the good manuscripts uh, uh, argued against effectively a, a traveling well. But there were some good ones that argued for it. And I argued that I, I felt the ones that argued against it were a tad bit better. But I, at the end of the day, I said, let's not base anything on that. If there's such a textual problem, don't base any. And he was basing. A lot of his argument was based on that. So you've got to be so careful. And uh, so, um, all right. So then we've got, um, I'm not going to, well, that's a very interesting one. I'm just tempted. Now, we, we got uh, in Psalm 68, 18, remember? The, uh, we talked about that, the end of the quotation. He gave gifts to men in Ephesians. But in the Psalm, it's he received gifts. We're going to have my doctoral student, one of my doctoral students come in and give a lecture on that. So you'll also get a little bit of a pause from my lecturing, which probably would be good. Um, so, um, and, then, and then that one in Galatians 3.16, very interesting. Uh, Longenecker sees that as a result of, of just uh, bad Jewish exegesis. In, in Galatians 3.16, it's a, it's a hugely crucial text. If you have that text open, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. And so Longenecker and others think, well, you know, Paul is saying he, he doesn't refer to seeds, plural, but to one seed. And we all know, and therefore he must be referring to Christ in the Old Testament. And that's the way Paul understood it. But seed, uh, in, in the singular, if you read it, singular can be corporate. And, um, and so uh, here, um, Longenecker is saying, look, Paul, it's kind of embarrassing. He tries to say, because Paul alludes to singular seed and not plural seeds, he must be referring to the Messiah. When in reality, a, a single seed is corporate. Okay, I mean, you can have, you know, your, if we talk about your seed, you might have three children, not just one. And so uh, Longenecker says, how embarrassing, you know, for Paul to do that because he doesn't use the plural, but the singular, he must be referring to Christ when all along, I mean, the, we all know the singular is corporate, you know, or it can be very, very often. However, uh, an article has been written in Tyndale Bulletin by a guy by the name of John Collins who's from Covenant Theological Seminary. And um, he, uh, he shows that probably Paul is referring to a specific Abrahamic promise here. And in Genesis uh, 22, it's probably from that particular text where in verse 17, God says to Isaac, I'll greatly bless you, I'll greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of his, um, his enemies. That's interesting. Okay, let's read it again. I greatly bless you and greatly multiply you, your seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So usually it's your seed will possess the gate. But now there's a seed, but there's also a singular his here. So it's either a king of the seed or it's a singular conception, an individual conception of the seed itself, which intriguingly through later Old Testament exegesis in Psalm 72 is applied to the eschatological king in Psalm 72. There, there is a verse 17. It says, may his name, it's, this is speaking of the eschatological ideal king, ultimately Jesus, of course, in the light of the New Testament. But in, in 72, 17, the psalm, may his name endure forever, may his name increase as long as the sun shines. Let men bless themselves by him. Let all nations call him 
blessed. And um, the LXX of Genesis 22 and verse 18, even in the Hebrew, it can be translated. If you're reading with me here, going back, we're going, we got 72, Psalm 17, Genesis 22. Genesis 22 says, And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed or shall bless themselves. So this, the, 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 the verses 17 and 18 are carried over. Let men bless themselves by him. It's the king. So the, uh, uh, him possessing the gate of his enemies uh, is this king, and nations will call him blessed. So this phrase here, verse 17 of Genesis 22, I'll greatly bless you, I'll greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. It's identifying, I think, here the seed uh, both corporately and individually. And Psalm 72 takes that individual seed by, uh, as the eschatological um, uh, king, uh, by which people will bless themselves. And so if that's the case, John Collins argues it is, that it's more specific, and this is a beautiful interpretation uh, of the seed. Yes, it's corporate, as it is in Genesis 22, but it's also singular. And, um, and so Paul understands that. So um, beautiful interpretation. Uh, now, uh, then there are allegorical interpretations. We'll define allegory a little later, but at the very least at this point, we can say that uh, allegory is the reading in of a meaning that the original author could never have had. And we'll talk more about allegory when we get to typology and how it's distinguished from typology. We've already said that Paul allegorizes Deuteronomy 25 and 1 Corinthians 9. He thinks that Moses speaking of the, uh, you know, do not muzzle the ox while he's threshing is uh, uh, really about the apostles. Well, that's a beautiful example of reading in a contemporary idea back into an ancient author, okay? And... Um, but we argued that really wasn't the case. But that's a good example of that. Longenecker thinks it's the case. And then there are atomistic interpretations. Atomistic is just interpreting non-contextually. So it's just a, a catch-all. And so, so I conclude here uh, that two things need to be said by, uh, about such examples. First, it's by no means certain that even these examples are actually non-contextual. That's why I took some time to explain some of them in, in a contextual way. And a number of scholars have offered viable and even persuasive explanations of how every one of these could be good cases of contextual interpretation. But even if it's granted that they are convincing examples of non-contextual hermeneutics, they certainly wouldn't represent the main trend of how the New Testament uses the old. But I don't really grant this even if. I'm really right up here. So... Um, but I just ran across a scholar. I'm not going to tell you what school it's at. I, I'd like to. It's a very conservative reform school. Very conservative. And, and this particular scholar argues that most of the time the New Testament writers are misinterpreting the Old Testament. He's very much into postmodernism. And um, that's interesting. You, you find this in some very conservative schools. The reason I mention that, he, he thinks the main trend here is non-contextual, not just a few examples. And uh, it's really rather startling. I finally wrote him, because he wrote a written response, which I read, to a book I wrote, which was Hidden But Now Revealed, you know, on mystery. He read that and reviewed it. And um, so I, he wrote a his long, long review and sent it to me. And he said, I'm thinking about publishing it. And, and I said, well, before you do, here's what you need to read. Because he, he had, hadn't read most of the literature on the old and the new that talked about how a lot of these problem texts are not problem texts. And I said, so don't publish until you've done that. Now, if you disagree with all of them, okay. And publish it and explain why you disagree. But um, just to say generally, well, New Testament's like Judaism and it's typically non-contextual. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, um, well, that's that. Um, 
Let's come back to the main outline. Just to comment again on C.H. Dodd here. Um, as I said, Dodd's work was really pretty monumental in his time in scholarship. I mean, you know, believing pastors, uh, the church from most of the church age has interpreted the Old Testament contextually, but at any rate, in scholarship, it was a monumental work. And uh, again, arguing just that the numerous scattered quotes and allusions are tips of, iceberg, uh, of an iceberg pointing to the uh, broader Old Testament context. Um, as I said, some disagree with Dodd, and a number of scholars agree with him. For myself, I do think we need to qualify uh, what it means that the New Testament interpreted the Old Testament contextually. How do we qualify that? Well, there are degrees of contextual awareness. I have no problem with that. I mean, there are degrees of contextual awareness. High degree, maybe a low degree, but there's still some degree. So that there is a, an organic link, an organic string that's going back to the original meaning of the text. Now, it may be small, and that may be the intention of the author, just to allude to a, a, a small part of that context. But so, so we need to qualify it in that way. Um, of course, in, in, in the case of the ironic uses of the Old Testament, it looks like the author's using it in the opposite way it was intended. But once you understand the literary device of irony, well, then it makes sense. Um, okay, let's look at the presuppositions themselves. Um, so the distinctive presuppositions of the Apostles' exegetical method what were the presuppositions which inspired the writers to use the Old Testament in the way, for example, Dodd was saying? Um, Dodd believed this was unique, by the way, in Judaism. Well, I think there's some truth to that, but I've already shown that Judaism has more contextual exegesis than you know, we might uh, think at first glance, especially when you hear a lot of the sweeping statements by the scholars. Um, so... Um, Let's, let's go over some of those presuppositions. I think they're presuppositions that some commentators uh, talk about some of these presuppositions. Even Longenecker talks about some of them. Um, but it doesn't seem to influence his general view of the old and the new. Um, I tried to go more deeply into what these presuppositions are and how they're tied integrally into the way the New Testament writers interpreted the Old Testament. And so uh, these, these presuppositions then uh, are the following. So let's look at them. You have this on your page. This is a supplement now to Roman numeral three. First of all, the assumption of corporate solidarity or representation. Just as we're corporately identified with Adam, he represents us. His disobedience and condemnation represent us if we don't believe in Christ. Um, and we're corporately identified with Christ, right? If we believe in him, then we come into union with him, identified with him, so that his obedience is passed on to us and his, just, uh, his justification. By the way, he was justified, um, though he didn't have sin. Um, 1 Timothy 3 says that... His, uh, that he was vindicated, he was dikaio, dikaio is a word for justify, he was dikaio by the Spirit by, through the resurrection. Well, how could he be justified? Well, the wrong verdict of the world given to him was overturned by his resurrection. He was vindicated. And so when we come into identification with him, we're vindicated. When we come into identification in union with his resurrection, we're vindicated. It's amazing. And um, though he didn't have sin, we do. We're vindicated all the more, justified. But you could translate it vindicated, declared righteous. And so, um, so that, 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 that's corporate identification. As I said, you know, remember Achan in the book of um, Joshua? Um, he had stolen the uh, gold, you know, was it silver also, and uh, some other valuable things and hid it underneath uh, the ground of his tent. 
and God began to plague Israel. Finally, they, they figured out who it was. And not only was Achan judged, but his family was stoned. And uh, so he represented the family. Um, and just as Moses represented Israel um, as, as, a, as a prophet, kings represented their peoples, as I said yesterday. So, so the, 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 this is a very important presupposition. And what follows from it, the reason it's important is Christ is viewed here. Christ is viewed as the true Israel of the old, true Israel, uh, uh, the church in the New Testament. So he, those who believe in him, become part of the church. And um, since he is viewed as true Israel, um, then the church uh, in the New Testament is viewed as true Israel. So uh, he represents all believers, both of the old and of the new. Um, so that, that's huge. It's a huge, huge presupposition. And I've given you another handout. And on the front of it, it looks like this. Oh, let me pull this off. That just gives you uh, some of the, uh, a little bit more explanation of corporate representation. Gives you more illustrations. I'm not going to read over it. I've summarized some of it. But also, I, but I, what I want to do is E.E. E. Ellis has a book. And in that book, and I think this is your second page, if you look at the, uh, the footnote there, there are two good books. If you really want to get a handle on corporate identification in the Old Testament, these are two books that you need to read. One is by A.R. Johnson, The One and the Many in the Israelite Conception of God or sacral kingship in ancient Israel. Uh, another one is H.W. Robinson, Corporate Personality in Ancient Israel. And this has a good extended bibliography on the issue and the debates around the issue. For example, to say corporate personality is probably not the best thing because uh, originally scholars who began to see corporate uh, identification in the Old Testament, they called it corporate personality because they were reading in sociological studies from uh, uh, the Pacific Islands, where the chief, you know, the head person in a, in a village, uh, uh, represented everybody. But also, there was this belief that they all shared in some magical way in his personality. And so, that began to be imported into the Old Testament as well. And now, uh, people are saying, no, yeah, there's corporate identification, but, but not personality. So, that, that's important to, to, to realize. Um, Okay, um, you know we've been going for a while. Why don't we Why don't we take a, a break? We've been going almost for an hour and a half. Let's just take a try a five minute break. See how that goes, and and then we'll come back and go till five. Get a big break at that point. Okay. Yeah. This is part of our break now. <laughs> we're, co we're coming back at 15 till. <laughs> so save, can you save your question? I can. I can. You want to ask me now?
And um, let's look at these presuppositions. Um, I think that the uh, what really solves why New Testament writers interpret contextually is these presuppositions. These presuppositions undergird their interpretation. Um, for example, uh, when we begin to look at this, just take this alone, uh, corporate solidarity and that Christ represents uh, his, his people. All of a sudden, you can take prophecies about Israel's deliverance and you can apply them to an individual Messiah. Why? Because he represents the people of God. What's true of the people of God is true of him and vice versa. Or um, a prophecy about the individual Messiah applied to uh, not only a plural group of people, but predominantly Gentiles, um, uh, it, it can be applied because they're corporately related to him. Um, or the prophecies of Israel again and their restoration and deliverance can be applied to predominantly Gentile church. Why? Because they're true Israel. They're corporately identified with Jesus and they're true Israel and can legitimately fulfill that. This is not allegorical. It used to be the dispensationalists and even progressive dispensationalists thought that people like me were allegorizing. How can you do that? I mean, how can you do that? Well, once you understand a legal corporate hermeneutic, it's beautiful. It all just fits. And, and that's literal interpretation, quite frankly, because the corporate understanding is a literal understanding. So now I'll tell you where the progressives are, the uh, Craig uh, Blazing, Daryl Bach. They will accept the idea that Jesus is true Israel. This is, a, from my perspective, a bit of a new development. Well, Walkie said, I mean, I can't agree with all those dispensationalists. Right. Walkie was like, you guys, you gave away the farm. The, the progressives gave away the, the dispensational farm, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And that's yeah. Walkie's view on that. Yeah. Um, so, what was I talking about? I lost my train of thought. Progressives. Progressives, it's just. Progressives and literal, literal. corporate personality. Corporate okay. Um, he said he's willing to give you that Christ is true Israel. Something like that. Ah, thank you, thank you. Man. So the progressive dispensationalists are willing to admit Jesus is true Israel. But what they won't admit is that the church, that's one aspect of corporate solidarity that doesn't carry over they're not true Israel. Because if they are, they think that demands a replacement theology. And it doesn't. Now, for me, it, so, so for example, Don Carson and Doug Moo, we're identical in our understanding of old and new biblical theology. We have two differences, and it's not in biblical theology. It's over the exegesis of Romans 11, 26, and the premillennial text in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. That's why they're premillennialists. But you can still have the church being true Israel. You can still have a future for Israel, in their view, and a millennium. I don't, because I interpret those passages differently. But those are two texts that, that really make the whole difference. Now, they're historic premillennialists, not dispensational or progressive. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that makes a lot of difference. So uh, I, along with Doug Moo and, and, and Don Carson... We, we, yeah, of course we're corporately identified with Jesus as true Israel, and that makes us true Israel. But progressives won't go that step because they think it means no more future for ethnic Israel in the tribulation and in the millennium, takes them especially. Out of the picture. Takes them out of the picture. It doesn't have to. Right. It's depend, it depends on how you interpret Revelation 20 and Romans 11:26. Now, since I interpret them uh, in a different way than Carson and Moo. Yes, it takes the. There, I don't see a place for ethnic Israel in the future, but my biblical theology doesn't demand that. Okay, so. Um, Shouldn't there be a future for ethnic Israel even without a millennium? Just like there, it seems to me that the kingdom of God is intensifying, and what's going to happen is the, the tribulation is also going to right. intensify, mm -hmm. and that should. If you want to call it suddenly tribulation, like the old school dispensationalists yeah. would find. Right. Right. 
I think there will be a, a final severe tribulation. Yeah. Um, just like that type of thinking, like still being kind of an amillennialist, doesn't negate that type of thinking. Couldn't there also be included in that an ethnic Israel? Well, I, I think there is a future for ethnic Israel. But my understanding of Romans 11, 26, you remember verse 25 says, Paul says, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, partial hardening is a little vague. What he means is the majority are hardened, okay? Mm -hmm. That partial, it just means it's not the whole, but it's the majority. So let's paraphrase. Uh, that the majority of Israel has been hardened until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, okay? Verse 26 starts with kai hutos, and not thus, and not then, there's not a chronological sequence. Hutos is in this manner. Kai hutos pas Israel sotheisatai. And in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Well, you've got to go to the Kai. Remember, context is king. In what manner will all Israel be saved? Verse 25. It's a remnant saving manner. A remnant saving manner. It's that concept of remnant they, they all throughout Scripture. From, and, and since it's future tense, I'm saying, well, that's specifically future. But I think Paul is talking about from his time onward. And what bears that out is Romans 9, where it says, though Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant, so Thesatai, will be saved. But he's talking about what's happening even now. Romans 10, 12, quotes Joel. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, so Thesatai, will be saved. But obviously that's beginning now. And when he quotes he actually, the rest of verse 26 introduces Old Testament quotation. And so he's, I think, uh, using sothesitai in that already and not yet since. He's keeping the Old Testament future tense. But as we've seen in other passages, that's begun to be inaugurated. And so uh, uh, in this manner, that is in a remnant-saving manner, all Israel will be saved. So I definitely think there's a future for ethnic Israel. I think that's what's being talked about there, not Gentiles. Now, Calvin, Tom Wright, and others think it's the church. In this case, I don't. I think there are other places where the whole church is considered the true Israel, including the predominant Gentile makeup of that church. But I think this is ethnic Israel. So ethnic Israel in total is saved, so to speak, by its remnant. Uh, and in this manner, in a remnant-saving manner, all Israel will be saved. So you've got to take all Israel from uh, the time of Paul until the very end. So it's the accumulation of the remnant. Uh, yeah. What? Yes. Yeah. I think. So. Yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think that's what's going on now. <laughs> Doug Moo disagrees with me. We had a debate with our students at Wheaton, and um, so he, he believes that it's exclusively future. But he's different from most in that he believes it's not the majority of Israel will be saved, it's only the remnant. So he thinks it's only a remnant salvation in the future, which really goes along well with my view. I just believe it's already and not yet. He believes it's future. So uh, it was really, it was weird. But your, your, your thought is that it's from the time of Paul, what he, what he wrote there in yeah. Romans 11. Yes. It's an accumulated yes. remnant of believing yes. Jews. Yeah. Which makes yeah. sense. Everywhere in the preceding context, context is king. When he's talked about Israel, it's ethnic Israel. And that's the problem of taking it as the church. It's, it's ethnic Israel who becomes part of the church, if you will. Right. Okay. Well, and then uh, the whole grafting of this and right. that, that, that all makes sense. When that's right. That that's right. Some take the root into which they're, 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 they're grafted into the tree and the root uh, as, as the patriarchs. Exactly. But Romans 15 says it's Jesus. Yeah. From Isaiah 11. He's the root. That's the closest use of it. And so, anyway. All right. Let's, let's keep going on. I don't want to have to give a lecture. I have a long, long, long four-hour lecture on Romans 11. I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't want to hoist that on you. So let's look at these uh, presuppositions, which uh, I think gave them a unique hermeneutic. Because I think these presuppositions caused them to interpret uh, uh, according to uh, the context and according to Old Testament pre uh, 
presuppositional roots. All of these go to the Old Testament, as you saw, uh, for corporate representation. Uh, those books that I, I, I showed you uh, in the footnote there, are these are about the Old Testament. So we find this in the Old Testament. We find it in the New. Um, and so um, if, if you want some text on Jesus' as true Israel, one of the most amazing ones is in the Old Testament itself, and that's Isaiah 49.6, uh, which says, sorry, 49.3, which says, you are my servant Israel. And his task is to restore uh, uh, um, Jacob and the preserved ones of Israel. And uh, so the, the servant is not a remnant group restoring the rest. can't be because the group being restored is called the preserved ones of Israel. I mean, that, that, that's a reference to the remnant. So this is an individual. It's not the nation restoring itself. It's not a, a remnant restoring. This is an individual who is to be identified with the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And so uh, he is, uh, that's a really clear reference to him being true Israel. And, um, and that's applied in Luke 2.32 to Jesus. In Luke 2.32, uh, we find this statement. It says, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. That's what um, Jesus was going to be, this child, this Simeon. And uh, in, in that phrase, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Uh, a light of revelation to the Gentiles comes from Isaiah 49.6. And the glory of thy people Israel comes from Isaiah 49.3. The first part says... You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. And so this text quotes three verses later and then comes back and quotes the glory. Um, it identifies him with the glory. And you're the glory of your people. And uh, he, the, the, the servant would be the glory of your people Israel. So you are my servant, whom I'll show my glory. So, um, and there, there are other passages. Uh, which allude to the same thing. For example, Isaiah 26, 23, and uh, other, other texts. Um, certainly Galatians 3, 16 uh, is a text on, on Jesus' is true Israel. The seed is certainly Israel there uh, in Isaiah 20, uh, in Genesis 22 and elsewhere. And so uh, that Jesus is the seed. Um, uh, shows that, that he is true Israel. It's another way of talking about Israel, the, uh, the, the word seed. Um, i trying to recollect the exact phraseology again there of that Galatians text. Just a, yeah. He's referring to many and to one, and your seed, that is Christ. Seed was a way of talking about the descendants, the ethnic descendants of Israel. And now Jesus is the true Israel. He is the seed. And uh, all those who identify with him become the seed. Um, we could go to other texts. Um, if you look at um, the texts in the Old Testament that already expect uh, that God's people in, in the eschaton that Gentiles will become um, true Israel. For example, um, Isaiah. Isaiah 56. which says, um, speaking of eunuchs, in verse 5, I will give in my house, I'll get, to them I'll give in my house, within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to Him and to love the name of the Lord, to keep, be His servants. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath, who holds fast my covenant, uh, even these I'll bring to my holy mountain and uh, make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings or sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. 
So he's going to bring eunuchs who were prohibited from being in the temple and Gentiles who were prevented from uh, uh, being in the temple as priests. And he's going to make them to be priests. Verse 6 says, to men, foreigners who are going to minister to him. And so um, uh, the idea, not only will Gentiles in the end be true Israel, but they'll, they'll even be uh, they'll even be priests. And I, Isaiah 66 um, reiterates that. He says in Isaiah 66, 21, I will take some of them, Gentiles, for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. Now, that's a tough text. And to understand that text the way I understand it, you would have to have my New Testament biblical theology uh, where I explain this text in detail. And uh, I, I have two chapters on the church's true Israel in, in that book. And uh, in the first chapter, I lay out that the Old Testament already had the presupposition that Gentiles were going to be a part of true Israel. And in there I talk about Isaiah 66. So this idea of Gentiles being true Israel in the eschaton is not new. This is Old Testament. It's another example that this is just the, the, the part of this presupposition is uh, already rooted in the Old Testament. I could give more. There are other, there are other texts, but we just don't have time to go into all of them now. Um, so those are two presuppositions. Where, where did the Old Testament, the Old Testament had those presuppositions? Yeah. We're more like the Jews who are, I feel like, this whole the sins that shall die. Yeah, if, if we're more individualistic. If the father sins, he'll pay for it. Right. You know, the right. proverb that the kids will eat, the right. parents will eat the grapes, and the kids will have wings for trees or whatever. Like, how does that, my first question is, where do they get their, okay. the well, all we can say is that beginning with, with the revelation in Genesis, that God begins to reveal these, and then they're developed in later scripture. I think that would be, uh, mm -hmm. that would be the answer. You, you could you progressive revelation, but you, you could also ask, wait a minute, um, how does Moses find out this stuff about Genesis one through eleven? Anyway, yeah. He wasn't around. So it's revelation. So, well, I think in that case, certainly partly revelation, but probably there was preserved oral tradition from from Noah and, and those who went out from him. Yeah. So probably it's both and, not either or. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, you begin to see how these things begin begin to work in uh, um, you know in the early parts of the Old Testament and how, how they're developed. Um, so uh, Deuteronomy twenty eight to thirty two, for example, is very very clear on corporate representation. For example, um, Moses will say in that context, Deuteronomy twenty eight to thirty two, he says uh, speaking to um, He's speaking to the second generation there. But he says, God brought you out of Egypt. Well, that was the earlier generation. And he starts talking about presently what God's doing with you. Okay, And then he says, in the latter days, God will do this to you. But that's latter days after their generation. So this is uh, that's a corporate continuity of God's, of God's people. It's everywhere. This is, this is, I remember my question is trying to put that out. Okay. This is, when you talk about mysterion, when Paul says mysterion, he really locates it. Ephesians and Colossians. This is like it was partially revealed. Their union with Christ idea was not totally brand new. It was embedded in this whole yeah. corporate solidarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And take, now he's just saying, yeah. this is the, this is now the fullness of it. Yeah. Take take the suffering servant of Isaiah fifty three. First mentioned, I think, in forty nine three. You're my servant Israel, and you'll restore them. How by suffering for them. But then right after Isaiah 53 in the following chapters, for the first time in the book of Isaiah, you get God's people being called servants, plural. Well, why is that? I think the answer to it is they're identified with the eschatological servant. Mm -hmm. And so they're servants, plural. Another example, I think, of corporate continuity uh, and corporate representation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think you're, you're exactly on, 
the right track. There's so much I want to go into here. It, it, it could be two or three lectures itself. I wish I could. Um, uh, if we have time, which we won't, I, I might go back into some of this stuff. But but you can, just to refer, you know, if you can, uh, you can buy this book, try it. Chapters on true Israel, two chapters, and the very first one I go to all the Old Testament text. Um, in, for example, Ezekiel 47, 22 to 23, Psalm 87, Isaiah 19, uh, 16, Zechariah 2, 11, and 8, 23, uh, Isaiah 66 that I read, and show that already Gentiles are being considered in the eschaton to be true Israel. And it's no different than what happened in Israel's history. Um, you would have to, uh, uh, if you wanted to become part of true Israel, well, you'd move to true Israel, okay? Like, like Rahab did, like Ruth did, um, like, um, oh, uh, who's the guy that David killed? Um, Goliath? No. no, not Goliath. Uh, later, we, he, he sinned. Um, um, Uriah. Uriah. Yeah, Uriah. He, he was a, an alien who became uh, an Israelite. And so the Israelite prophet, the Bible prophesies, there's just going to be a greater regathering, uh, the, the gathering of Gentiles into Israel. And so just as Gentiles used to become Israel, they'll become Israel again. But now, the new revelatory revealed mystery is, you don't have to move to Israel, geographical Israel. Why? Because Jesus is the true Israel. You move to Him. So if you want to be in the temple, you don't move to the temple in Israel, you move to Jesus. Yeah, you become part of the temple. Exactly. You are the temple of God. Right, as he dwells yeah, in you. Yeah, yeah. If you want to be uh, truly circumcised, Colossians 2 says you're circumcised in Christ. You don't have to go to Israel and get circumcised. Uh, if you want to be clean, you don't have to obey Israel's dietary laws. You trust in Jesus. You're cleansed that way. And so that, that's an escalation. All these things pointed to Jesus. Uh, it's not a wild hermeneutic at that point. So uh, just as temple clearly points to him and circumcision, et cetera. So um, all these things um, are, are very helpful, I think. Now, let's go to the third one. The third presupposition, and by the way, I hope you can see this does solve a lot of those problems of how can you apply an, an individual Messianic prophecy to the church? How can you apply uh, a prophecy of Israel to the Messiah? How can you apply a prophecy of Israel to Gentile church? All of a sudden... If you don't have the presuppositions, then you're wild and crazy, okay? And this is why, for example, um, dispensationalists, including, I think, progressives, um, they, they, they will argue that when it looks like the church is fulfilling a prophecy of Israel, that it's only analogical. It's not fulfillment, okay? Because they... They can't. They, they, if they if they see the Gentiles are Israel, for them that means that means a, a replacement theology. Trickle down blessing to us, Christ. Yeah. yeah. And my view is I don't I don't like replacement theology because that cuts off continuity with the Old Testament. It's like this stops. Jesus replaces. Start something new. No, Jesus is the continuation of true Israel. He is the continuation of the true temple. He is everything it all represented. So it's not. It's continuation. It's not replacement. But uh, when people see that I don't see a future for Israel, they say, yeah, it is. Uh, you're, you're, you're a replacement. And that doesn't demand it. As I said, uh, uh, Moo and, and Carson, uh, we're identical. It just is the difference really ultimately between a couple of texts, would, I think. Would you say this is also a catching point, not necessarily to say Israel, but Messianic Jews? Oh, my gosh, yes. Because And, and, and they believe in their churches it's normative to keep the Old Testament rituals. Right. If you want to be a part, if you want to be a part of that church, I think that is unbiblical. I think that's unbiblical. If they want, to, if they say, you know, if you want to keep these festivals in your house, that great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but not to make it a requirement for the, for the church of God. That is, I think, crossing the line, and. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. He sure is. He trained me. He had a great method on old and the new, but he never, I, I think he eventually would have left. Well, maybe he wouldn't. He died when he was 88, so. How much longer did he have You know, maybe. I don't think more, 10 more years would have made the big difference, so. Yeah, he was converted in the ministry of Donald uh, uh, Barnhouse, okay. who was a dispensationalist. And um, I think it was hard to, you know, when you get an imprint when you're young, you know, like like uh, you get, uh, you know, um, a dog, a mother dog that kind of becomes the mother to a baby cat. Well, the cat thinks, you know, that's his true mother, you know, and never wants to leave the true mother. And so Johnson never wanted to leave the true mother. His wife was also an avid dispensationalist, too. Okay. That had something to do with it, I think. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, he has a great method on older than the new. So, um, and he did, uh, he did see my commentary in Revelation, and uh, I, I heard secondhand that he thought it was a good commentary so that's interesting um at any rate all right um let's go to this one uh another presupposition that history is unified by a wise and sovereign plan so that the earlier parts are designed to correspond and point to the latter parts and uh, here we we could mention such temporal merisms as the following what is a merism by the way it's the totality of polarity you mentioned two extremes, that the psalmist says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I ascend to the depths of the sea, you are there. And it doesn't mean he's just in those two places. He's everywhere in between, okay? It's a totality of polarity. And so we, we have uh, um, such uh, uh, texts where, where God, uh, for example, in Ecclesiastes 3, a very famous passage, there's an appointed time for everything. Time for every event under heaven. So God's appointed it. Now, notice the merisms. Time to give birth, die. Time to plant, time to uproot. Time to kill, time to heal, time to tear down, time to build up, time to weep, time to laugh, time to mourn, time to dance. And he just goes through these merisms uh, to show that the whole is included just as with, with, with the psalmist and um, Isaiah... Um, likewise uh, speaks of this. In fact, when God says, I am the one who was and is and is coming, it not only means that he's present throughout history, but he was there in the beginning and he'll be there in the end. And he's sovereign over the whole of history. And so, uh, and you find those merisms in, in Isaiah uh, with, you know, I'm the first and I'm the last. And sometimes we'll put the middle in just, just to make sure you understand it, uh, as he did with the one who was and is and is coming. I'm the first and last. Of course, we find that language, don't we? Alpha and Omega, first and last, in Revelation 1, 8, 17, 21, 6, 22, 13. And so um, that's, uh, that's huge because if history is, in fact, under God's sovereign hand, all of it, then he plans the earlier parts to be similar to the later parts, and there's a reason for that, because that similarity is designed to show that those earlier parts point forward to the latter parts, and we'll talk more about that, but this is the basis. This is the basis uh, for, then, typology, okay? This is the, one of the theological bases for typology. You see that in Luke 24, you see the same? Yeah. We're going to look at that in just a second. We're going to look at that in just a second. Excellent. Um, a fourth presupposition. The age of end-time fulfillment has come in Christ. So that the, the latter days have come. And um, in, in the first of my book here, in the New Testament Biblical Theology, I go through every use of latter days in the Old Testament. And um, every one of them are future-looking. Just interesting. When you get to the New Testament, they'll use that same phrase, sometimes even alluding to some of those texts, but it's now inaugurated. And so this is where we get already and not yet eschatology. 
The Old Testament prophesied the latter days. They've begun and they'll be consummated. Begun with the first coming, consummated at the last coming. But the New Testament writers would interpret through the lens uh, of eschatology. And, um, and I think uh, rightly, rightly so. I, I, let me give you one example of, of that. And um, let's see here. I think I have that somewhere. Ah, yeah, here it is. So when we speak of eschatological restoration, remember we were looking at the blueprint use, the prototypical use of the Old Testament, and we saw that it could be based on a text or a theme, like the theme of restoration, which we actually saw in Romans 9 through 11 and Galatians, okay? <clears throat> and so the New Testament again and again and again takes restoration prophecies, eschatological restoration prophecies, uh, as beginning to be fulfilled in the New Testament, and, uh, and then consummated later. The, the Gospels are clear on that. Um, what we looked at in Luke 4, uh, where Jesus picks up and picks Isaiah up and reads it, well, that's a restoration text. He says, now this is fulfilled in your midst. It's amazing. And it's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's all over the Gospels, all over Paul, and uh, in Revelation as well. And this actually brings us, and all, uh, this is just a little excursus on the eschatological presupposition, because restoration was eschatological. And um, when you look at uh, the things that were to happen at the time of Israel's restoration, well, let, let's see, see how, let's do a little test here. Um, you don't have to answer, but because I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the answers if you can't answer. But uh, what was to happen? There were a number of things that was to happen at Israel's restoration. Anybody? What, what were some of the things that were to happen? New covenant. New covenant. Beautiful. Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Coming of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, the rejuvenation of the land. Like some type of okay. desert will be turned into... New creation. Yeah. Yes. New temple. Sorry, don't get too excited. I love it. <laughs> there was to be a huge temple. Right. Yeah. Excellent. But none of it was called the kingdom, right? Until after. That was all put under the heading of kingdom. Right? But, I, but it's not in the Old Testament. The kingdom, the, the word kingdom is not used, right? Or no, am I confused on something? I, I've struggled with that, obviously, because I'm confused right now. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the word kingdom is, so is, is, is used. Jesus, Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. Right. Mark 1. Right. And I go back into the prophets. Yeah. I don't find that language, that kingdom language. So well, it certainly was prophesied, the kingdom of Messiah. But you certainly have Israel's kingdom under David and so oh, forth okay. and so on. So you, you have that, and that, some of that's typological of the kingdom. But then there's the kingdom to come because Israel's rejected stuff. And so there's going to come a time when God's kingdom will really come on earth through his Messiah. Okay. So I'd say it's probably, that, that's the way I would. I, okay, okay. But wouldn't a part of the restoration be Messiah. Right. Messiah was to come. That's pretty huge. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Here's a, and so here we, we can summarize it here. Have it on, on the overhead. Um, what happened when Israel comes from Babylon, comes back again? Because some think that that fulfilled the restoration prophecies. Um, but when they come back, and it's only a remnant who comes back, there was no Messiah. There was no new creation, no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There was no new covenant or forgiveness. There was no temple. It was a pathetic thing. In fact, when they saw the rebuilding of the temple, they cried. Yeah. Yeah. Ezra and, and, um, and Haggai. Yeah. And um, they were still sinful and idolatrous. By the way, they were to be out from under foreign oppression when they returned from exile. No. First, they're, they're under the... Uh, uh, um, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so all of these things did not happen. Now, there are two ways to deal with this, okay? One, that all these things come to pass right before and at Christ's coming 
in a millennium especially. That's when these things happen. So that right now, Israel rejected all of this, and we're in a parenthesis age, the age of the church. So it's not the age of the fulfillment of these restoration prophecies, okay? Or it occurs at Christ's first coming and is consummated at his second coming. And when you look at all, like just what we read yesterday from Luke 4, it's a restoration prophecy. It's now this is happening. Yeah. He's standing right in front of you. Right. Yeah. And by the way, at hand doesn't mean, oh, it's still yet in the future. Right. Right. At hand means it's beginning. In fact, Chris Karagunas, a Greek New Testament scholar, uh, um, said that even today the Greek word for touch is ian gudzo, which means to draw near. Just touch. It's just something that's just beginning to be initiated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, um, in Matthew, Matthew 12, for example, Jesus uh, uh, is talking uh, to the Pharisees, and um, they warned him, he warned them not to make himself known. He says, in order that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. And he quotes a restoration prophecy from uh, Isaiah 42.1, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom... I'm well pleased. He'll proclaim justice to the Gentiles, so forth and so on. This is part of the restoration because remember Isaiah 49, 6. He'll not only restore the tribes of Israel and preserved ones uh, of Jacob, but he'll be a light to the nations. So the nations have got to come in too and, and, and become part of the true people of God, Israelites. Um, and by the way, some don't like, some uh, classic and, and, and progressive dispensationalists don't like my view because I'm saying everybody becomes identified mainly as corporately identified with the last Adam, Jesus, and true Israel, Jesus. And they say, well, that extinguishes their nationalities. No, no more than Rahab's nationality was extinguished. No more than uh, uh, Uriah's nationality. He was still considered to be, they knew who he was. Right. And, and the new heavens and earth, they're, they're going to be and all... And the, who cares? <laughs> and, and who cares? But no, they want they want Israel there. You see, right? I know they want ethnic Israel there. Man, all, all, all I want to carry is the name of Christ. <laughs> that's good enough for me. <laughs> and they would say that's good enough for them. Yeah. yeah. So to be to be fair, um, so this is huge. How you understand when this is going to happen? You'll go one of two ways. You'll have a more what we might call a, a gap hermeneutic. A dispensational hermeneutic of discontinuity, or you'll have a hermeneutic that this began with Jesus and it'll be consummated. And these presuppositions help us see that the church is beginning the restoration of Israel. Now, Jesus is the true um, uh, Israel, so that when he was put to death, that was the epitome of Israel's exile. It was a greater exile than in Babylon or in Assyria. Why? Because it wasn't just physical for Jesus, it was. It was spiritual. He was separated from the Father. So even those physical exiles, in fact, just pointed to a greater exile. So he went through a greater exile than any Israelite in exile ever went through. And then when he rose from the dead, he was Israel being restored to the Father. And when we trust in him and are unified in his resurrection, we're being restored. And now we're on the restoration way. We've been restored. That's why in the book of Acts, Remember the name for the church? Anybody? The way. You know where that comes from? Isaiah 40 and verse 3. Make, prepare the way of the Lord. Found in most of the Gospels at the beginning. And because they're, they've been restored and they're on the restoration way. It's beautiful. Beautiful, isn't it? But just that, even that concept that only one person in the history of mankind has ever known what it truly like. Hmm. 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 And this is very practical, by the way. It's very practical that he went through the exile that none of us will ever go through, but he did it for us. But you know, when we suffer, whether it's persecution, whether it's sickness, whatever it may be, it's important to align yourself with Jesus and know that he went through at least a little bit of that suffering. Your, your suffering is just a little bit 
of an overlap with his huge suffering. But it's important to, to, to identify yourself with, with the cruciform life of Christ. It gives meaning and true meaning to our suffering. It's very important. Which puts power in what he said even on Matthew 28. He said, I'm with you. Amen. Yeah. You're never alone. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. By the way, that's part of a temple text. <laughs> so, but, you got to go to my, you got to go to my, I, I can't, I, we'll get way behind if I, if I do that. And it's part of a son of man text. Yeah. To me, all authority has been given in heaven and on earth. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I can't get into it. Um, okay. Um, so that, that's very, very, this is very, very important. I just wanted to introduce that as a little excursus on the eschatological presupposition. Um, so that, now let's go to, I mean, I'm, I'm taking, we may, we may have to jettison a lecture here, but I want you to get the full foundation before we get into the lectures. And I'm not, you know, I'm letting you ask questions because we're a small enough group and I think we can have that dialogue, but understand it's going to slow things down. That's okay, as long as you're okay with that. If you want to quit talking, let me know. And let me tell you, I can machine gun it. I mean, people, people have said, I, I, I can almost be an auctioneer, but uh, at any rate. So, now, fifth, as a consequence of presuppositions four, presupposition four, presupposition five states that the latter parts of biblical history function as the broader context to interpret earlier parts because they all have the same ultimate divine author who inspires the various human authors and one deduction from this premise is that Christ, as the center of history, is the key to interpreting the earlier portions of the Old Testament. How do you like that for a German sentence? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, that's a lot. Uh, I should break that into two or three. But um, mainly, this is a, a Christocentric uh, uh, presupposition. But it's combined with the notion the latter parts of biblical history expand upon and interpret the earlier parts. And, uh, uh, and as you see this through a Christocentric lens, it actually does shed light on how everything is unified. Um, I, I used to, Gordon Conwell, teach this course. And then a friend of mine in Old Testament taught a course called Christ in the Old Testament. And because he's there. And, um, uh, but there, there are two different things here. There's Christocentric, and there's also Christotelic. Now, Christotelic has been defined in one of two ways. Number one, they had the presupposition that Christ was the goal, just as Romans 10, 5, 10, 4 says, remember, that, that, that Christ is the telos of the law, that he's the goal of the Old Testament. And then they said, and they'd use that presupposition and go back to the Old Testament and distort text and read Christ in where he really wasn't. Well, I, 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 don't take that, I don't take that approach. Uh, for me, uh, as you look at the Old Testament, it's not just that it is Christocentric, that its subject matter ultimately pertains to Christ, but that it's geared toward a goal, a goal that, that consummates with the first coming of Jesus Christ and uh, when Scripture is rightly seen in that light, passages fall into place. Um, and I, and I want to uh, talk about that just uh, for, for a little bit here. Um, so I say that um, it's only in the light of this pre Fifth presupposition that we may legitimately speak of a census plenior of Scripture. I don't like that phrase because some people understand that to mean you can find meanings in the Old Testament that the author never would have guessed, and it even contradicts it. I don't like census plenior. But all it means is fuller sense. Now, in that sense, okay, that's fine. Um, I would just define it as... Uh, uh, the full meaning of Scripture, uh, of which 
an Old Testament author may not have been fully aware of. So Old Testament authors certainly have an idea of what they're talking about, but that may be expanded in the New Testament. But it's like a seed expanding into the apple tree, bearing blossoms. So you might look at the tree and look at the seed, and if you didn't know anything at all about botany, uh, you know, maybe you came from outer space or something, and you said, well, there's, those are two different things. And that's why some people, you can maybe see why, oh, well, this has nothing to do with that Old Testament prophecy. Look how that's being developed. But what's interesting is that that seed already begins to be expanded in the Old Testament. Yeah, just one through three could all be Old Testament, Old Testament. Yeah, right. definitely. I'm saying it's all, it's all already based on Old Testament interpretation. Okay? Yeah. In fact... Uh, this one is typologically present. As I, I think I said yesterday, you get new creation with Noah, but then it sputters out. Oh, right, yeah. So it, 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 it's apparent eschatology, apparent inaugurated eschatology. But it's not true eschatology because it's reversed. Okay, yeah. They do return from Babylon, but, you know, it, it's clear that's not the case. So those events then become typological. But you do, in that sense, you get an anticipated inaugurated eschatology. And how about this one, Christocentric or Christotelic? I would contend that the Old Testament is messi messiotelic. I mean, you already get it in Genesis chapter 3, you know, with, with the uh, seed of the woman who crushed the serpent. And then... Uh, and that's what Valheimer argues, right, for the, yes. for the law. Mm -hmm. That's messiotelic. I mean, he, he might have used that right. terminology, but... Yeah. Yeah. He said the law is begging for yeah, yeah. Right, right, which are eschatological texts. Isaiah 49, um, Numbers 24. Um, he also does it from the Psalms a little bit. Yeah. But there's one on the Yeah. Oh, Deuteronomy 32. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so let me expand on this just a little bit. Um, this Christocentric slash Christotelic notion. Um, yeah. Okay. Christocentric or better Christotelic view of all scripture. And, and I say here, uh, for that view, look at the following text. I mean, 2 Corinthians one twenty is amazing. As many as are the promises, i.e. in the Old Testament, they are yes in Jesus. And then he immediately begins to expound on that. He talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit in the next verse or two. Coming of the Spirit. That was a restoration promise. He then talks about New Covenant. Restoration, chapter 3. In chapter 5, new creation. Inextricably linked. In uh, the following verses on into chapter 6, the first to 7, those are restoration promises, one of which is the temple of God. Remember? He says, you're the temple of the living God, as God said, and then he quotes restoration prophecies about the temple. They're fulfilled in, uh, in the Lord. That's why I'm seeing these things. These can't be put off, okay? They can't be put off. The dispensationists want to see analogy. When prophecies are quoted, they want to see analogy, but the context is prophecy. So if it's going to be cited in the New Testament, it's either something yet to be fulfilled or it's beginning fulfillment. It's not analogy. Especially when chapter 7 and verse 1, after you have all these, what well, I'd like you to turn with me there. Turn to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see it. This is amazing. Chapter 6. You all right? Um, well, fire hydrant. So is... <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Speculative thing. It's yeah. not speculative. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. You're making some yeah. you know, right. uh, things there. But, yeah. Um, but I, mean, I, 
Well, I think you're right. I think move it back to chapter 4 because there he says, yeah, is that what you're speaking of where he says that uh, the end of verse 4, chapter 4, Christ is the image of God, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So, so here we have, you know, the image of God language right. from, going was, back to Genesis. I was thinking chapter 5 when he says we're new creations now. Yeah. And now we're a part of this reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. New creation has been launched and we're co-laborers with God just as we were originally designed with Adam to create a new world with God. I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Okay. If you can find, if you can find some, I mean, I think thematically, generally, very broadly, yeah. But is it in this text? Yeah. Um, uh, if there, are, if you can find some allusions to Genesis in this text, not just in chapter four, mm -hmm. but in this text, ooh, that's interesting. So I would, I, I'd have to, I haven't found them yet, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Right. So um, it's, it's, it's certainly possible. But if you look at chapter six, he says, verse sixteen: What agreement has the temple of God with idols? We're the temple of the living God, just as God said. And then he quotes. Ezekiel 37:27 and Leviticus 26:12. They're combined together because Levit Ezekiel is developing Eze uh, Leviticus. We're the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them, walk among them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. These are about the priests. That's from Isaiah 54. Or, sorry, Isaiah 52. And... Um, I will welcome you. That's a restoration text from Ezekiel. I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me, says the Almighty. Now, now, a dispensational and progressive dispensationalist might say this. At the end of verse 16, just as God said. Well, as God said. We're the temple, as God said. Well, this is just a comparison. We're not really the fulfillment, okay? But notice chapter 7, verse 1. You can't say that. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. These are promises. They're not analogies. This is fulfillment. This is not the analogical use of the Old Testament. Of course, analogy is involved because if there's a prophecy and fulfillment, there's going to be similarity, but it's much more than that. And it's bringing the holiness to completion. If we're really priests, if we're really priests, then, verse 1 of chapter 7. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, completing holiness in the fear of the Lord. Priests were to keep the temple clean. Yeah. And so that's... And if we're just like priests and like a temple, well, it would, it's not as strong. But if we really ontologically actually are beginning to be the actual temple, not just like a temple, but the actual temple, then we better actually keep ourselves clean. That's amazing. So, so this redemptive historical fulfillment is hugely practical. It's hugely practical. This is not airy-fairy theological debate among dispensationalists and, and, and others. I went to dispensational school, and I am glad I did. Now, maybe I'd be more glad if I'd gone somewhere else. I don't know, you know. But I learned to exegete there, I think, in a way I wouldn't have learned anywhere else because they loved the Bible. It was inspired. And they exegeted. Well, they kept, well, we used to, I don't think it's, they just keep telling you what does it say, what does it say, what does it say, and then eventually you figure out what it says. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is a little bit different, but it does. It makes a big difference. I agree. Like if you just, I found myself keep having to say, well, I'm not quite that, I'm not quite that, I'm not quite that. Yeah. You know, and yeah. Even with the because only Israel would truly be that, yeah. but I'm, I'm kind of like that, but, but I'm, I'm, it's an analogy. And, and intriguingly, this is interesting. Talk about topsy turvy and turning things around. Dispensationalists and progressives um, are—I uh, don't want to say pride themselves. I don't mean that negatively, mm -hmm. but they pride themselves in being literal interpreters. That is, seeing a prophecy and wanting to see a physical corresponding fulfillment. Physical, okay. Ironically, when they come to the New Testament and, and it makes statements about the church age, that we're temple priests, etc. They become figurative interpreters. Yep. Isn't that interesting? They have to interpret figuratively. So here's the question. It's not whether we're literal interpreters or figurative. It's where are you literal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where are you figurative? Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Okay? Man, this, this is, well, it's all good stuff. Because the 
thing about that seven one, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, yeah. bringing holiness to completion. What were the duties of a, a priest? Yeah. I, I was just looking at it. Was the, it keep the temple clean. Disting, uh, uh, make distinction between the holy and the common, and the clean and the unclean. Yeah, yeah. Right and, there. And this is a specific development from the preceding quotation. It says, do not touch what is unclean. That's a prophecy. They've begun to be not only the temple, but priests in the temple. It's amazing. It's amazing. So this is, this is what I call the hermeneutic of redemptive historical ontology. Ontology means actual being. A hermeneutic of redemptive historical... I just created that phrase. I like it. The, the redemptive historical hermeneutic or ontological hermeneutic. Now, let, let me talk about some other things here with regard to this crystal... Christocentric or Christotelic view. And uh, I first of all mentioned Second Corinth, Corinthians one twenty. One one professor of Old Testament at Wheaton said, well, Bill, you know, really, he doesn't have all the promises of God in mind. He's just got the ones he lays out in Corinthians, which makes sense. But, but I would say that's what's on the top of his mind. Not only, but that's what's on the top of his mind. I think he has all the promises. And remember I told you, I think all the promises of God begin fulfillment. And so I challenge the class, you know, as I, I always do, yeah. Give me one promise that's not inaugurated. So have you thought of any? One that's not inaugurated. I have them, but could, could we could maybe use devil's advocate with what, whoever that professor was? Yeah. Uh, was it Walton? No. Okay. Richard Schultz. Okay. Um, so in the Old Testament, Joshua maybe, I forget what. Yeah. Actually, not one of the promises, of all the good promises that, oh. that God had given Ooh. to Israel. Ooh, that's a good comeback. That's you know, great. Is that then how Paul is using this? Maybe in that yeah. same kind of PG Interesting. Of, not a rhetorical one because that wouldn't yeah. be a good one to use. But, uh, right, right. Some other, Maybe uh, using it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the meaning of it in Joshua. This is good. Is this, is this a dispensational text that I never had answered either? So you're, do dispensationalists well, go to that text and say. Well, I may not have the answer here. This is my view. <laughs> um, yeah. It's very clear in context that not all the promises are fulfilled. Okay. So if you apply that to this text, Christ fulfills some of the promises, but not all of them. Ooh. I think I'd already take, I, I would prefer the totality view than the view that there's some he just doesn't fulfill. Okay. Now, what you could say is, well, he'll fulfill the rest at the second coming. Okay. I mean, you could say that, you know, but uh, it doesn't quite fit with Joshua because you know, they just about uh, uh, control the borders of the land, but things are just not quite right. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's a little different. Yeah. It's not that things aren't just quite right right here, I don't think. I, that would be weird. Yeah. But, I mean, it's possible that what's on the top of his mind here or just what's laid out in, in, in Corinthians. Um, but um, but I tend to think that... Uh, it's 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 probably all of the promises. Um, so let's let's go to Luke 24. Luke 24, and um, let's see here. Let's I, I want to read that. Luke 24, 25. So many a number of you have mentioned it. He's talking to the Emmaus Road travelers who were followers of Jesus. It says in verse 25, Jesus speaks to them because they're wondering, hey, you know, Jesus is supposed to rise, he hadn't risen. And he says to them, verse 25, Luke 24, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. That is, all the scriptures. And then um, verse uh, 32, um, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. That's what ought to happen to us as we read his word. And then verses 44 to 45 repeats this. Now he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand, to understand the scriptures. And I think he did that through his hermeneutical approach. And they display that approach, uh, the contextual approach. 
But especially, I think, what I want to focus on here uh, in, in, in those words is verse 27, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets. He explained to them the 